Incomplete 1.4.1.1 Scroll to begin. Scroll to begin. Sum Point four summary. Incomplete one point four point. Incomplete 1.4.1 Conclude Incomplete 1.4.1 Scroll to 1.4 Summary Scroll to begin Incomplete 1.4.1 Conclusion Incomplete 1.4.1.1 Chapter 1 Introduction to Personal Computer Hardware 1.4.1.1 Chapter 1 Introduction to Personal Computer Hardware In the beginning of this chapter, you were introduced to the contents of a computer and the safety guidelines that can prevent electrical fires and injuries while working inside a computer. You also learned about ESD and how it can damage the computer equipment if not discharged properly. Next, you learned about all the components that make up a PC starting with the case that houses all of the internal components. You learned about the various form factors of case and power supplies and how they have evolved over time. Next, the various types of connectors that are used to power various internal components such as the motherboard and storage drives, such as serial at attachment, SATA, MOLUX, and PCIe were discussed as were the voltages provided by the connectors. You also learned about motherboards, which is the backbone of the computer that contains buses or electrical pathways that connect electronic components. These components include the CPU, RAM, expansion slots, chipset, the BIOS, and the UEFI chips. Different types of storage devices such as hard disk drives, optical drives, and solid-state drives were also discussed along with the different versions of PATA and SATA interfaces that connect them to the motherboard. Motherboard The commonly used tools were explained, and the computer disassembly process was demonstrated. At the end of the chapter, you disassembled a computer as part of a hands-on lab. Incomplete 1.4.1.2 Introduction to Personal Computer Hardware Quiz 1.4.1.2 Introduction to Personal Computer Hardware Quiz Incomplete question 1. Multiple choice question. Which three devices are considered output devices? Choose three. Incomplete question 2. Multiple choice question. A network administrator currently has three servers and needs to add a fourth, but does not have enough room for an additional monitor and keyboard. Which device allows the administrator to connect all the servers to a single monitor and keyboard? Incomplete question 3. Multiple choice question. Which action can reduce the risk of ESD damage when computer equipment is being worked on? Incomplete question 4.
Four. Multiple choice question. Which type of input device can identify users based on their voice? Incomplete. Incomplete question 5. Multiple choice question. How are the internal components of a computer protected against ESD? ESD Incomplete question 6 Multiple choice question A technician wants to replace a failing power supply on a high-end gaming computer. Which form factor should the technician be looking for? Incomplete question Question 7. Multiple choice question. Refer to the exhibit. How is the connector used in a PC? Ponents. Incomplete question 8. Multiple choice question. Which expansion slot is used by an NVMe compliant device? Incomplete question 9. Multiple choice question. Which disk drive type contains a magnetic HDD with onboard flash memory serving as a non-volatile cache? Incomplete question 10. Multiple choice question. Which port allows for the transmission of high definition video using the DisplayPort protocol? Incomplete question 11. Multiple choice question. Refer to the exhibit. What type of connector is displayed? Multiple choice question. Complete question 12. Multiple choice question. Multiple choice question. Multiple cho Multiple cho Incomplete question 12. Multiple choice question. Which statement describes augmented reality, AR, technology? Technology. Incomplete question 13. Multiple choice question. 
Which two PC components communicate with the CPU through the Southbridge chipset? Chipset. Choose two. Incomplete question 14. Multiple choice question. What is the maximum storage capacity of a single DDR5 DMM stick? Stick? Incomplete question 15. Multiple choice question. Which motherboard form factor has the smallest footprint for use in thin client devices? Click.
2.0 Introduction Scroll to begin. Incomplete 2.0.1 Introduction Incomplete 2.0.1.1 Welcome 2.0.1.1 Welcome Assembling computers is often a large part of an IT technician's job. You must work in a logical, methodical manner when working with computer components. At times, you might have to determine whether a component for a customer's computer needs to be upgraded or replaced. It is important that you develop skills in installation procedures, troubleshooting techniques, and diagnostic methods. This chapter discusses the importance of component compatibility. It also covers the need for adequate system resources to efficiently run the customer's hardware and software. Computers, computer components, and computer peripherals all contain hazards that can cause severe injury. Therefore, this chapter begins with general and fire safety guidelines to follow when working with computer components. In this chapter, you will learn about PC power supplies and the voltages they provide to other computer components. You will learn about the components that are installed on the motherboard, the CPU, RAM, and various adapter cards. You will learn about different CPU architectures and how to select RAM that is compatible with the motherboard and the chipset. You will also learn about various types of storage drives and the factors to consider when selecting the appropriate drive. It is important to not only learn about assembling computer components, but also to build hands-on skills. In this chapter, there are several labs where you will assemble a computer. Each of the labs have you progressively install components such as the power supply, CPU, RAM, drives, adapter cards, and cables until computer assembly is complete. Home. Next. Two point one assemble the computer. Scroll to begin. Incomplete two point one point one general and fire safety.
Complete 2.1.1.1 Video Explanation, General and Fire Safety 2.1.1.1 Video Explanation, General and Fire Safety Select Play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello everyone, it's time to talk safety. Let's go over some guidelines in order to avoid cuts, burns, electrical shock, and damage to your eyesight. To start off, we want to remove any watches or jewelry, and also secure our loose clothing. Done. We also need to make sure that we turn off and unplug any equipment before we work on it. A safe and usable workstation is going to be a clean workstation, so make sure you keep food and drinks and any clutter out of our workspace. We also need to make sure that as we work inside of a computer case, that any sharp objects should be covered with tape. For your own safety, you should never open a power supply or a monitor that has a built-in power supply. And while we work, it's very important to wear safety goggles to prevent damage to your eyesight. When you go to lift those heavy computer towers, printers, servers, and more, make sure that you bend your knees when you lift heavy objects to avoid injuring your back. As we work with electrical and dangerous components, you never know when something might catch fire. You should always know where the closest fire extinguisher is and also how to use it. As we discuss fire safety, it's important that you remember to never fight a fire that is out of control or not contained. You should make sure that you know how to get out of the building quickly that you are in. And don't forget to contact emergency services for help. Make sure you're prepared. You should locate and read the instructions on any fire extinguisher near your workspace before you use them. Also, you should make sure that the fire extinguisher is going to work. For example, this fire extinguisher no longer is ready to work. It needs a recharge. Now a fire can spread very quickly and also be very costly. You should know the basics of using a fire extinguisher to prevent a small fire from getting out of control. The word you have to remember is PASS. P stands for pull the pin. A stands for aim at the base of the fire, not at the flames. S stands for squeeze the lever. S stands for sweep the nozzle from side to side. You should be familiar with the different types of fire extinguishers. Some fire extinguishers, they're actually designed for paper, wood, plastics, and cardboard while others are designed for electrical equipment or even gasoline or combustible metals. This fire extinguisher here is rated for a couple items. It's rated for trash, wood, and paper. It's rated for liquids, grease, and it's rated for electrical. Let's take a look at my fire extinguisher in action. Incomplete 2.1.2 Open the case and connect the power supply. Complete 2.1.2.1 Video demonstration Install the power supply. 2.1.2.1 Video demonstration Install the power supply. Select Play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Incomplete 2.1.2 Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. We've got our PC desktop tower here. 
We're going to open this thing up and get started in the installation of a power supply. I've got my anti-static mat down and I've got my anti-static wrist strap connected to it. So we're going to be good to go to get started. So I'm going to take this computer tower and we're going to place it on its face. So I'll put it face side down. And by doing this, what we're going to see here on the back is going to be this huge slot. This is our power supply slot. Now, right now we've got nothing there. So this is where we're going to install our power supply, which we have ready for us sitting on our mat. To start, step one is to open the right side cover of the computer case. So I'm going to put this thing back down on its right side, and I'm going to use my Torx screwdriver to unscrew this screw holding on this computer case. I'll slide off the cover, and we'll be able to take a look at the inside of our computer tower. Now at this point in time we have an empty computer tower. We have nothing installed at the moment. All we have are some USB and audio headers attached to the front of the case. If I put the case front side down, we can view these adapter card slots here right above the power supply slot on the back. Our power supply unit known as a PSU, that's what we're about to install. So let's chat about the PSU. Now, right now with this PSU, it's got so many watts. This is a 450 watt power supply. And on this PSU, it is currently slept to 115 volts, the US standard. If you look closely at the PSU, we can actually take a look at more details of it, including form factor for the PSU. But that's not for us at this moment. Now, for us, Make sure you plan ahead and choose the correct power supply unit for your computer build, especially if your CPU and choice of graphics cards are going to pull a lot of power. Now, step two, we need to align the screw holes of our power supply with this power supply slot. So we have the power supply slot here. I'm going to take my power supply and put it into play. And we can take a look at those screw holes that are about to line up and see if we can lock this in. Now my case is really cool because it actually has a locking mechanism that I can let go of the power supply. My screw holes are aligned and it is currently locked into place. Now we need to take the action of screwing it in. If you look closely, you'll see those screw holes are currently lined up and we can even get a closer view based off of my camera. There we go. So what we wanna do now is lock those screws into play. So I'll take four of my power supply screws and we get to put this thing in and be done. All four screws are installed. The power supply is not going anywhere. Hopefully you chose the correct wattage for your internal parts. Otherwise, you'll be switching this thing out in the very near future. Thanks for watching our power supply install. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select 2.1.2.2 Check your understanding. Install the power supply. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the submit button. Match the step number to the description. 1, 2, 3, screw the power supply into place, open the computer case, align the screw holes on the power supply with the mounts on the computer case, submit, incomplete 2.1.2.3 select the case and fans. 2.1.2.3 Select the case and fans. The choice of motherboard and external components influences the selection of the case and power supply. 
The motherboard form factor must be matched with the correct type of computer case and power supply. For example, an ATX motherboard requires both an ATX compatible case and power supply. You can select a larger computer case to accommodate additional components that may be required in the future. Or you might select a smaller case that requires minimal space. In general, the computer case should be durable, easy to service, and have enough room for expansion. List of expandable sections. Select each button to expand the content. Select each factor affecting the choice of a computer case for more information. Model type. The type of motherboard you choose determines the type of case that can be used. The size and shape must match exactly. Size. If a computer has many components, it will need more room for airflow to keep the system cool. Power supply. You must match the power rating and connection type of the power supply to the type of motherboard you have chosen. Appearance For some people, how the case looks doesn't matter at all. For others, it is critical. There are many case designs to choose from if it is necessary to have a case that is attractive. Status display what is going on inside the case can be very important. LED indicators that are mounted on the outside of the case can tell you if the system is receiving power, when the hard drive is being used, and when the computer is in sleep or hibernate mode. Vents All cases have a vent on the power supply, and some have another vent on the back to help draw air into or out of the system. Some cases are designed with more vents in the event that the system needs a way to dissipate an unusual amount of heat. This situation may occur when many devices are installed close together in the case. Cases often come with a power supply pre-installed. IT Essentials A computer has many internal components. Cases often come with a power supply pre-installed. In this situation, you still need to verify that the power supply provides enough power to operate all the components that will be installed in the case. A computer has many internal components that generate heat while the computer is running. Case fans should be installed to move cooler air into the computer case while moving heat out of the case. When choosing case fans, there are several factors to consider as described in the following table. Note, the direction of air flow created by all the fans in the case must work together to inject cooler air and expel hotter air. Installing a fan backwards or using fans with the incorrect size or speed for the case can cause the air flows to work against each other. Incomplete 2.1.2.3 Table 1 Factors Consider Case Size Larger cases often require larger fans because smaller fans cannot create enough air flow. Fan speed. Larger fans can spin more slowly than smaller fans, which reduces fan noise. Number of components. Multiple components in a computer create additional heat, which requires more fans, larger fans, or faster fans. Physical environment. The case fans must be able to disperse enough heat to keep the interior of the case cool. Number of mounting places available. Different cases have different numbers of mounting places for fans. Location of mounting places available. Different cases have different locations for mounting fans. 
Electrical connections. Some case fans are connected directly to the motherboard, while others are connected directly to the power supply. Incomplete 2.1.2.4 Select a power supply. 2.1.2.4 Select a power supply. Power supplies convert AC input to DC output voltages. Power supplies typically provide voltages of 3.3V, 5V, and 12V and are measured in wattage. The power supply must provide enough power for the installed components and allow for other components that may be added at a later time. If you choose a power supply that powers only the current components, you might need to replace the power supply when other components are upgraded. The table below describes various factors to consider when selecting a power supply. Be careful when connecting the power supply cables to other components. If you have a difficult time inserting a connector, try repositioning it or check to make sure that there are no bent pins or foreign objects in the way. If it is difficult to plug in a cable or other part, something is wrong. Cables, connectors, and components are designed to fit together snugly. Never force a connector or component. If a connector is plugged in incorrectly, it can damage the plug and the connector. Take your time and make sure that you are connecting the hardware correctly. Note, make sure to select a power supply with the proper connectors for the types of devices to be powered. Complete 2.1.2.4 Table 0 Factors to consider when choosing a power supply. Factors. Consider. Type of motherboard. The power supply must be compatible with the motherboard. Required wattage. Add the wattage for each component. If the wattage is not listed on a component, calculate it by multiplying its voltage and amperage. If the component requires different levels of wattage, use the higher requirement. Number of components. Make sure the power supply provides enough wattage to support the number and types of components plus another 25% at a minimum. Type of components. Make sure the power supply provides the right types of power connectors. Type of case. Make sure the power supply can be mounted in the desired case. Incomplete 2.1.2.5 Lab, install the power supply. 2.1.2.5 Lab, install the power supply. In this lab, you will install a power supply in a computer case. Install the power supply. Income. Lab install the power supply. Introduction. In this lab, you will install a power supply in a computer case. Recommended equipment. Power supply with a compatible form factor to the computer case. Computer case. Toolkit. Power supply screws. Instructions. Step 1. Open the computer case. A. Remove the screws from the side panels. B. Remove the side panels from the computer case. Step 2. Install the power supply. A. Align the screw holes in the power supply with the screw holes in the case. B. Secure the power supply to the case with the power supply screws. C. If the power supply has a voltage selection switch, set this switch to match the voltage in your area. Questions. What is the voltage in your area? Type your answers here.
How many screws secure the power supply in the case? Type your answers here. What is the total wattage of the power supply? Type your answers here. D. This lab is complete. Please ask the instructor to verify your work. End of document. 2015 to 2019 Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco Public Page 1 of 1. www.nitacad.com Incomplete 2.1.3 Install the motherboard components. Complete 2.1.3.1 Video demonstration Install the CPU. 2.1.3.1 Video demonstration Install the CPU. Select Play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. we're going to install a CPU, Central Processing Unit, into our motherboard. Here is an exercise that is not commonly done in the classroom. We're going to take a CPU, like this chip here, and we're going to install it into our motherboard slot. Now what we must do is orient the CPU. Step 1 is locating pin 1. Pin 1 is usually what indicates how the CPU orientation should work. We have a triangle which we'll be able to see right here. Let me zoom in. And this triangle is what's going to inform us of the alignment of pin 1. Now, if we go to our motherboard and we open up our motherboard slot, if we look closely, what we'll be able to see here as well is that same triangle marking. And that triangle marking is right here, which shows us the orientation for our CPU. Now, our CPU also has a keyed slot on it. And on the CPU on the motherboard housing, you'll also be able to see here that we'll be dropping the CPU and there's keyed slots to ensure that it's correctly aligned. Now that we know how it should be aligned, step two is to safely lower the CPU into the CPU slot. For step three, we can lower the CPU housing and lock the lever into place to hold our CPU firmly in place. For step four, it is important that we take some thermal paste and we're gonna place a pea-sized drop carefully on the top center of our CPU. This thermal paste will help the distribution of heat from the CPU to the heat sink that we will install next. Now to keep this CPU cool and prevent it from overheating, we are going to install a heat sink for step five. These commonly have a fan attached to them, but not all of them do. These fins we see here are going to absorb the heat from the CPU and have slots for airflow to move in between. The fan on top of the heat sink will help draw the heat away and cool the fins. This will allow them to absorb more heat from the CPU. As we attempt to place the heat sink on the motherboard, it may take one to two attempts to position it correctly over the screws that are going to surround our CPU. The final step, step six, is to screw down the heatsink. After positioning the heatsink correctly so that it aligns with the heatsink screws on the motherboard, we will screw in the four screws in a specific order. It is best to screw one corner first and then go to the opposite corner diagonally from it. This will help ensure we have a flush connection between the CPU and thermal paste and the heatsink. 
as I mentioned, we'll go diagonally across to the other corner. Now we can continue on the last two screws. Now that all four screws are locked in, the heatsink will not be able to move or shift at all. Having a tight and flush fitting will also allow the CPU to better stay cool. Thanks for watching our CPU install. Two dot one dot three dot two check your understanding, install the CPU. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the submit button. Match the step number to the description. Place the CPU into the CPU socket. Orient the CPU to the CPU socket. Secure the heatsink. Install the heatsink. Apply thermal paste to the CPU. Lock the CPU in place. 1 2 3 4 5 6 Submit. Show Feedback. Incomplete 2.1.3.3 video demonstration. Install the RAM. 2.1.3.3 video demonstration. Install the RAM. Select play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello everyone. At this point in time, we have our power supply installed in our case. We also have our heat sink installed on top of our CPU which is locked into the motherboard. Now, before we move this entire setup into our computer case, we will install the RAM modules. These are the RAM modules. It's much easier to install these now than after we have this entire setup screwed into the case. On our motherboard, we have two slots to add RAM. Take note of where the notches are on the RAM slots on our motherboard, right here and right here. These notches will line up with the notches on our RAM. Step one is to open the levers on the RAM slots of the motherboard. We're going to open them as far as they will go. They're going to click into place. This should require almost no force. Step two is we're going to line up the RAM module in the correct direction for the slot and that notch. Step three, we're going to slowly lower the RAM module into the slot. Step four, now use your thumbs to press down on both sides of the RAM module and you feel the RAM module will be locked in by the two lever arms on the motherboard. Next, we take the second RAM module. We'll verify the alignment again based on the notches on the motherboard RAM slot and we'll press the RAM module down vertically using both of our thumbs again. Give it a push downward using your thumb on the left and on the right, as it clicks in, now the RAM modules are installed. This is exciting. Proceed onward in the course. We're almost ready to put this motherboard into the computer case. Two. 
2.1.3.4 Check your understanding, install the RAM. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the step number to the description. Lower the RAM stick into the slot. Orient the RAM stick to the motherboard slot. Open the RAM slot levers. Press down firmly to lock in the RAM stick. 1 2 3 4 Submit Incomplete 2.1.3.5 Video Demonstration Install the Motherboard 2.1.3.5 Video Demonstration Install the Motherboard Select Play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello everyone! Can you believe it? We're going to install the motherboard with the CPU, heatsink, and RAM into our computer case. Before we just place the motherboard into the computer case and call it a day, we first need to install the standoffs into our computer case. These standoffs will be used to secure the motherboard in place within the computer case. Some computer cases will have built-in standoffs, like mine for example. Others, you'll have to take a standoff and install it yourself. These standoffs are commonly small, and you'll screw it in using an adapter that comes with the standoffs. In order to locate the standoff locations, it is best to take your motherboard and practice placing it into your computer case. Step one is to align the motherboard in the correct direction by having our adapter ports facing out of the back of the computer case. So we'll take our motherboard, The motherboard is resting in the case. Step two is to locate the exact standoffs that are needed by looking at the screw hole locations. If you take a close look at it, you can shift the motherboard and we'll be able to find the exact screw hole locations that will be needed. Step three is to remove the motherboard and then screw in the standoffs at the correct locations. Since my computer case does not require this step, we're going to continue on. Assuming you've installed your standoffs, step four is to take our I.O. plate, input-output adapter plate, and align it on the back of our computer case. This will provide adequate dust and airflow for our computer case. Let's position the I.O. adapter plate with the writing and ports in the correct direction. If you install the I.O. adapter plate upside down, the motherboard won't be able to fit correctly. So make sure that it's correct. As you put the plate into place, give it a push in each corner and along the edges and you'll hear it snap into place. Take your time on this step as some adapter plates are plastic while others are metal. They are possible to bend and or break. Now that the plate is installed, put the computer case back on its side for step 5. Lowering the motherboard into place. Let's finish installing the motherboard. The key of installing the motherboard is to put it into the case at the correct angle. As we place it in, we need to align the I.O. ports of the motherboard with the slots of the I.O. plate. If I pick up the case, we should be able to see it resting nicely. At this time, we can use our screwdriver for step six, installing the screws into the motherboard standoffs. One by one, we will install the motherboard screws. Make sure not to install the screws too tight as you don't want to crack the motherboard through excessive force. Don't worry about the screws being not overly tightened as we have a good amount of screws to keep this motherboard in place. If you choose to upgrade your CPU or heatsink in the future, 
Some gaming and high-performance heatsinks actually require you remove the motherboard and install special plate to the back. Let's get started installing those screws. Now that all the screws are tightened, we are good to finish our build and continue on to the next video. Who knows, you might be removing your motherboard and installing it again in the future. Get your practice with us here for installing a motherboard into a computer case. Incomplete 2.1.3.6 Check your understanding. Install the motherboard. 2.1.3.6 Check your understanding. Install the motherboard. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answers, select the submit button. Match the step number sequence for a PC assembly with the respective description. Install the screws into the standoffs. Align the motherboard in the correct direction. Install standoffs in the computer case. Lower motherboard into place. Align I.O. plate to back of computer case. Locate the standoffs. 1. One, two, three, four, five, six. Submit.
Show feedback. Incomplete 2.1.3.7 Select the motherboard. 2.1.3.7 Select the motherboard. New motherboards often have new features or standards that may be incompatible with older components. When you select a replacement motherboard, make sure that it supports the CPU, RAM, video adapter, and other adapter cards. The socket and chipset on the motherboard must be compatible with the CPU. The motherboard must also accommodate the existing heat sink and fan assembly when reusing the CPU. Pay particular attention to the number and type of expansion slots. Make sure that they match the existing adapter cards and allow for new cards that will be used. The existing power supply must have connections that fit the new motherboard. Finally, the new motherboard must physically fit into the current computer case. When building a computer, choose a chipset that provides the capabilities that you need. For example, you can purchase a motherboard with a chipset that enables multiple USB ports, eSATA connections, surround sound, and video. The CPU package must match the CPU socket type. A CPU package contains the CPU, connection points, and materials that surround the CPU and dissipate heat. Data travels from one part of a computer to another through a collection of wires known as the bus. The bus has two parts. The data portion of the bus, known as the data bus, carries data between the computer components. The address portion, known as the address bus, carries the memory addresses of the locations where data is read or written by the CPU. The bus size determines how much data can be transmitted at one time. A 32-bit bus transmits 32 bits of data at one time from the processor to RAM or to other motherboard components, while a 64-bit bus transmits 64 bits of data at one time. The speed at which data travels through the bus is determined by the clock speed measured in megahertz or gigahertz. PCI expansion slots connect to a parallel bus, which sends multiple bits over multiple wires simultaneously. PCI expansion slots are being replaced with PCIe expansion slots that connect to a serial bus, which sends one bit at a time at a much faster rate. When building a computer, choose a motherboard that has slots to meet your current and future needs. Incomplete 2.1.3.8 Select the CPU and CPU cooling. 2.1.3.8 Select the CPU and CPU cooling. Before you buy a CPU, make sure that it is compatible with the existing motherboard. Manufacturers' websites are a good resource to investigate the compatibility between CPUs and other devices. The following tables list the various Intel and AMD sockets available and their supported processors. Incomplete 2.1.3.8 Table 0 Intel Socket Architecture 775 LGA 1155 LGA 1,156 LGA 1,150 LGA 1,366 LGA 2011 LGA Complete 2.1.3.8 Table 1 AMD Socket Architecture AM3 Pin Grid Array PGA AM3 Plus PGA FM1 PGA FM2 PGA FM2 Plus PGA 
The speed of a modern processor is measured in gigahertz. A maximum speed rating refers to the maximum speed at which a processor can function without errors. Two primary factors can limit the speed of a processor. Transmission delay, the processor chip is a collection of transistors interconnected by wires. Transmitting data through the transistors and wires creates delays. Heat generation, as the transistors change state from on to off or off to on, a small amount of heat is generated. The amount of heat generated increases as the speed of the processor increases. When the processor becomes too hot, it begins to produce errors. The front side bus, FSB, is the path between the CPU and the north bridge. It is used to connect various components, such as the chipset, expansion cards, and RAM. Data can travel in both directions across the FSB. The frequency of the bus is measured in megahertz. The frequency at which a CPU operates is determined by applying a clock multiplier to the FSB speed. For example, a processor running at 3200 MHz might be using a 400 MHz FSB. 3200 MHz divided by 400 MHz is 8, so the CPU is 8 times faster than the FSB. Processors are further classified as 32-bit and 64-bit. The primary difference is the number of instructions that can be handled by the processor at one time. A 64-bit processor processes more instructions per clock cycle than a 32-bit processor. A 64-bit processor can also support more memory. To utilize the 64-bit processor capabilities, ensure that the operating system and applications installed support a 64-bit processor. The CPU is one of the most expensive and sensitive components in the computer case. The CPU can become very hot, therefore most CPUs require an air-cooled or liquid-cooled heat sink combined with a fan for cooling. The following table lists several factors to consider when choosing a CPU cooling system. Complete 2.1.3.8 Table 2 Factors Consider Socket type The heat sink or fan type must match the socket type of the motherboard. Motherboard physical specifications The heat sink or fan must not interfere with any components attached to the motherboard. Case size The heat sink or fan must fit within the case. Physical environment The heat sink or fan must be able to disperse enough heat to keep the CPU cool in warm environments. Incomplete 2.1.3.9 Select the RAM 2.1.3.9 Select the RAM New RAM may be needed when an application locks up or the computer displays frequent error messages. When selecting new RAM, you must ensure that it is compatible with the current motherboard. Memory modules are commonly purchased in matched capacity pairs to support dual-channel RAM that can be accessed at the same time. Also, the speed of the new RAM must be supported by the chipset. It may be helpful to take written notes about the original memory module when you shop for the replacement RAM. Memory may also be categorized as unbuffered or buffered. Unbuffered memory, this is regular memory for computers. The computer reads data directly from the memory banks, making it faster than buffered memory. However, there is a limit on the amount of RAM that can be installed. Buffered memory, this is specialized memory for servers and high-end workstations that use a large amount of RAM. These memory chips have a control chip built into the module. 
The control chip assists the memory controller in managing large quantities of RAM. Avoid buffered RAM for a gaming computer and the average workstation because the extra controller chip reduces RAM speed. Incomplete 2.1.3.10 Lab, install the motherboard in a computer. 2.1.3.10 Lab, install the motherboard in a computer. In this lab, you will install a CPU, a heatsink slash fan assembly, and RAM modules on the motherboard. You will then install the motherboard in the computer case. Install the motherboard in a computer. Incomplete 2.1.4 Install Internal Drives Incomplete 2.1.4.1 Lab install the motherboard in a computer. Introduction In this lab, you will install a CPU, a heat sink slash fan assembly, and RAM modules on the motherboard. You will then install the motherboard into the computer case. Recommended equipment Computer case with power supply installed. Motherboard CPU Heat sink slash fan assembly Thermal compound. RAM modules. Motherboard standoffs and screws. Anti-static wrist strap and anti-static mat. Toolkit. Motherboard manual. Instructions. Step 1. Install the CPU. Place the motherboard, the CPU, the heat sink slash fan assembly, and the RAM module on the anti-static mat. Put on your anti-static wrist strap and attach the grounding cable to the anti-static mat. Locate pin 1 on the CPU. Locate pin 1 on the socket. Note, the CPU may be damaged if it is installed incorrectly. Align pin 1 on the CPU with pin 1 on the socket. Place the CPU into the CPU socket. Close the CPU load plate and secure it in place by closing the load lever and moving it under the load lever retention tab. Apply a small amount of thermal compound to the CPU. Note, thermal compound is only necessary when it is not included on the heat sink. Follow all instructions provided by the manufacturer for specific application details. Align the heat sink slash fan assembly retainers with the holes in the motherboard around the CPU socket. Place the heat sink slash fan assembly onto the CPU and the retainers through the holes in the motherboard. Tighten the heat sink slash fan assembly retainers to secure it. Plug the fan connector into the motherboard. Refer to the motherboard manual to determine which set of fan header pins to use. 2015 to 2019 Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco public page 1 of 2 www.nitacad.com. Lab install the motherboard in a computer. Step 2. Install the RAM. Locate the RAM slots on the motherboard. Questions. In what type of slots will the RAM modules be installed? Type your answers here. How many notches are found on the bottom edge of the RAM module? Type your answers here. Align the notches on the bottom edge of the RAM module to the notches in the slot. Press down until the side tabs secure the RAM module. Ensure that none of the RAM module contacts are visible. Reseat the RAM module if necessary. Check the latches to verify that the RAM module is secure. Install any additional RAM modules using the same procedure. Step 3. Install the motherboard. Install the motherboard standoffs. Install the I.O. connector plate in the back of the computer case. 
Align the connectors on the back of the motherboard with the openings in the back of the computer case. Place the motherboard into the case and align the holes for the screws with the standoffs. You may need to adjust the motherboard to line up the holes for the screws. Attach the motherboard to the case using the appropriate screws. This lab is complete. Please have the instructor verify your work. Two dot one dot four dot one video demonstration install the drives. Two point one point four install internal drives. Complete two dot one dot four dot one video demonstration install the drives. Two dot one dot four dot one video demonstration install the drives. Select play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello everyone. In this video we get to install some drives. We're going to focus specifically on a hard disk drive and an optical disk drive. Now first, we have the hard drive. Now this is an adapter. It's not actually a full hard drive. It's a three and a half inch hard drive adapter. And the reason this is important is because people commonly like to purchase these type of drives. These are solid states. They come in a two and a half inch side, which is meant for a laptop. With adapters like this, we can easily take a solid state hard drive, drop it into position, and close the lever. As we close it, now the two and a half inch drive is in a three and a half inch adapter. With this being done, we can easily just slide this into our computer case and do the install of our screws. Now for my computer case, it accepts both two and a half inch and three and a half inch drives, so I don't need to require an adapter for my case. But at this point in time, we can take our two and a half inch solid state drive and we can install it into our case. When I line it up, with the two screws, which we'll be able to see there's many different screw holes on the side of these. We need to align it up perfectly with a set of the holes. Now for me, my two and a half inch hard drive fits beautifully right here. And then I can do my second screw. Now my two and a half inch solid state hard drive is installed. After this, we want to install the optical disk drive. First, we need to make sure our front panel of our case has been removed. The front panel of the case is right here. And this is the slot where we're going to install our optical disk drive. Now the first thing we need to do is remove this front panel because it's in the way for us to actually be able to access the optical disk drive. Here we have these levers that we can actually pull out. And every case will be a little bit different. But it'll have some type of snaps or levers. And I can remove that front panel. Now with it removed, if I put it on its back again, take a look at that. We have this bay here where we can slide in our optical disk drive. Now, as you slide the optical disk drive in, please make sure it's facing the correct orientation. That is extremely important. We'd hate to have to turn the tower upside down every time we want to use the drive. Now with my case, the drive locks in using a lever mechanism as I slid it in. As you saw previously with the power supply, this will hold it in place. So we can then just place our screws to lock it in, which we'll do now. Awesome. Next, we'll continue on with installing adapter cards to provide our computer tower with even more functionality.
Complete 2.1.4.2 Select Hard Drives 2.1.4.2 Select Hard Drives You may need to replace an internal storage device when it no longer meets your customer's needs or it fails. Signs that an internal storage device is failing might be unusual noises, unusual vibrations, error messages, or even corrupt data or applications that do not load. Factors to consider when purchasing a new hard disk drive are listed in the figure. Internal drives usually connect to the motherboard with SATA while external drives connect with USB, eSATA, or Thunderbolt. Legacy motherboards may only offer the IDE or EIDE interface. When selecting a HDD, it is important to choose one that is compatible with the interfaces offered by the motherboard. Most internal HDDs are available in the 3.5-inch, 8.9 cm form factor, however 2.5-inch, 6.4 cm drives are becoming popular. SSDs are generally available in the 2.5-inch, 6.4 cm form factor. Factor Note, SATA and eSATA cables are similar but they are not interchangeable. New hard drive factors Internal or external HDD, SSD, or SSHD Hot swappable Heat generation Noise generation Power requirements Incomplete 2.1.4.3 Select Optical Drives 2.1.4.3 Select Optical Drives Factors to consider when purchasing an optical drive are listed next to the figure below. New Optical Drive Factors Connector Type Reading Capability Writing Capability Optical media type. The following table summarizes optical drive capabilities. DVDs hold significantly more data than CDs and Blu-ray discs. BD store significantly more data than DVDs. DVDs and BDs can also have dual layers for recording data, essentially doubling the amount of data that can be recorded on the media. Incomplete 2.1.4.3 Table 1 Incomplete 2.1.4.3 Table 1 Optical Drive Capabilities Optical Device Read CD Write CD Read DVD Write DVD. Read Blu-ray. Write Blu-ray. Rewrite Blu-ray. CD-ROM. Yes. No. 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 CDRW. Yes. Yes. No. 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 DVD-ROM. Yes. No. Yes. No. 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 DVD-RW. Yes. 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 No. 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 BD-ROM. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. No. BDR. Yes.
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. No. B D R E. Yes. 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 Incomplete 2.1.4.4 Install the hard drive. 2.1.4.4 Install the hard drive. A computer case holds drives in drive bays. The following describes the three most common types of drive bays. Incomplete 2.1.4.4 Table 0 Types of drive bays Drive bay width Description 5.25 inches 13.34 centimeters Commonly used for optical drives Most full-size tower cases will have two or more bays 3.5 inches 8.9 centimeters Commonly used for 3.5-inch HDDs. Provide additional USB ports or smart card readers. Most full-size tower cases will have two or more internal bays. 2.5 inches, 6.35 centimeters. Intended for smaller 2.5-inch HDDs and SSDs. Smallest width bay. Becoming increasing popular in newer cases. To install an HDD, find an empty hard drive bay in the case that will accommodate the width of the drive, as shown in the figure. Smaller drives can often be installed in wider drive bays using special trays or adapters. When installing multiple drives in a case, it is recommended to maintain some space between the drives to help airflow and enhance cooling. Also, mount the drive with the metal side face up. This metal face helps to dissipate heat from the hard drive. Installation tip, slightly hand tighten all the screws before tightening any of them with a screwdriver. This will make it easier to tighten the last two screws. Screws Incomplete 2.1.4.5 Install the optical drive 2.1.4.5 Install the optical drive Optical drives are installed in 5.25-inch, 13.34cm, drive bays that are accessed from the front of the case. The bays allow access to the media without opening the case. In new installations, the bays are covered with a plastic insert that keeps dust from entering the case. Remove the plastic cover prior to mounting the drive. To install an optical drive, follow these steps. Step 1. From the front of the case, choose the drive bay that you want to hold the drive. Remove the faceplate from that bay if necessary. Step 2. Position the optical drive so that it aligns with the 5.25-inch, 13.34cm drive bay opening at the front of the case, as shown in the figure. Step 3. Insert the optical drive into the drive bay so that the optical drive screw holes align with the screw holes in the case. Step 4. Secure the optical drive to the case using the proper screws. Installation tip. Slightly hand tighten all the screws before tightening any of them with a screwdriver. This will make it easier to tighten the last two screws. Two.
2.1.4.6 Check your understanding, installing drives. Matching. Select from lists and then submit. Select true or false for the statements about installing internal drives. Optical drives are installed from the front of the case. It is recommended to hand tighten drive mounting screws. It is recommended to hand tighten drive mounting screws prior to using a screwdriver. Modern motherboards provide the IDE interface for internal drive storage. Please select an option. The SATA interface can be used to connect HDDs, SSDs, and optical drives. In installations in which CPU cooling is important, HDDs are preferred for storage. Please. Please select an option. When installing an HDD or SDD, the connectors should face the front of the case. Show feedback. Feedback Incomplete 2.1.4.7 Lab, install the drives. 2.1.4.7 Lab, install the drives. In this lab, you will install hard drive and an optical drive in a computer case. Install the drives.
Lab Install the Drives Introduction In this lab, you will install the hard disk and optical drives. Recommended Equipment Computer case with power supply and motherboard installed. Anti-static wrist strap and anti-static mat. Toolkit Hard disk drive Hard disk drive screws Optical drive Optical drive screws Motherboard manual instructions Step 1. Install the hard disk drive Align the hard disk drive with the 3.5-inch drive bay Slide the hard disk drive into the bay from the inside of the case until the screw holes line up with the holes in the 3.5-inch drive bay Secure the hard disk drive to the case using the proper screws. Step 2. Install the optical drive. Note, remove the 5.25-inch cover from one of the 5.25-inch external drive bays if necessary. A. Align the optical drive with the 5.25-inch drive bay. Insert the optical drive into the drive bay from the front of the case until the screw holes line up with the holes in the 5.25-inch drive bay and the front of the optical drive is flush with the front of the case. Secure the optical drive to the case using the proper screws. This lab is complete. Please have the instructor verify your work. End of document. 2015-2019 to Cisco and or its affiliates. Incomplete 2.1.5 Install the adapter cards. Incomplete 2.1.5.1 Video demonstration Install the adapter cards. 2.1.5.1 Video Demonstration Install the adapter cards. Select Play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello everyone. In this video, we can do install adapter cards. So first, what we want to do is take a look at our case. And we need to take a look at what adapter slots we have. Inside of my case, we can take a look at the motherboard and closer up. We have a PCI Express 16. And then we have three PCI Express 1s. So what we want to do is be able to pick out adapter cards that are going to be compatible with these PCI Express slots. Also, if you're wondering what this is, this is a mini PCI Express. Think of wireless cards that you'd be able to install in a desktop tower. So let's get started. Step one, we're going to need to find an empty slot, which we have right here. So what we need to do is take off the corresponding cover that covers that slot. To remove this cover, which is covering the slot, I have to lift up my tower and we'll take a look at what I need to do on the outside. This screw here is holding on to those adapter card slot covers. It keeps them in place. So I can go ahead and I can unscrew that with my special Torx screwdriver. With that screw out, we can actually take this cover and just lifts off and that exposes all the adapter card slot covers. At this time, I can actually take out this cover and it just lifts off and I can remove it from the computer case. Now the adapter slot cover is exposed and we're able to zoom back in and continue on. With that slot cover exposed, we can now install a PCI Express 16 card. I happen to have a PCI Express graphics card. It's a PCI Express 16, which we have here, which is the physical compatibility that matches that slot. Step two, I'm going to align the video card into the appropriate slot in the motherboard, which will be right there. For step three, we need to press down gently on this card to install it into place. Step four, we need to reinstall that slot cover. I will put my slot cover back on. 
And we will take our screw on our screwdriver and we'll screw it back into place. Thank you for watching. Our adapter card is now installed. Two dot one dot five dot two select adapter cards. Many of the functions of the hardware of a computer are found on board the motherboard, such as audio, USB, or network connection. Adapter cards, also called expansion cards or add-on cards, are designed for a specific task and add extra functionality to a computer. They can also be installed when an onboard function has failed. There are a variety of adapter cards available that are used to expand and customize the capability of a computer. The following list provides an overview of expansion cards that may be upgraded. Graphics card, the type of graphics card installed affects the overall performance of a computer. For example, a graphics card that needs to support intensive graphics could be RAM intensive, CPU intensive, or both. The computer must have the slots, RAM, and CPU to support the full functionality of an upgraded graphics card. Choose the graphics card based on current and future needs. For example, to play 3D games, the graphics card must meet or exceed the minimum requirements. Some GPUs are integrated into the CPU. When the GPU is integrated into the CPU, there is no need to purchase a graphics card unless advanced video features, such as 3D graphics or very high resolution, are required. Sound card, the type of sound card installed determines the sound quality of your computer. A computer system must have quality speakers and a subwoofer to support the full functionality of an upgraded sound card. Choose the correct sound card based on your customer's current and future needs. For example, if a customer wants to hear a specific type of surround sound, the sound card must have the correct hardware decoder to reproduce it. In addition, the customer can get improved sound accuracy with a sound card that has a higher sample rate. Storage controller. Storage controllers can be integrated or added as an expansion card. They allow for the expansion of internal and external drives for a computer system. Storage controllers, such as RAID controllers, can also provide fault tolerance or increased speed. The amount of data and the level of data protection needed for the customer influences the type of storage controller required. Choose the correct storage controller based on your customer's current and future needs. For example, if a customer wants to implement RAID 5, a RAID storage controller with at least three drives is needed. I.O. Card Installing an I.O. card in a computer is a fast and easy way to add I.O. ports. USB are some of the most common ports to install on a computer. Choose the correct I.O. card based on your customer's current and future needs. For example, if a customer wants to add an internal card reader and the motherboard has no internal USB connection, a USB I.O. card with an internal USB connection is needed. NIC Customers often upgrade a network interface card, NIC, to get wireless connectivity or to increase bandwidth. Capture Card. A capture card imports video into a computer and records it on a hard drive. The addition of a capture card with a television tuner allows you to view and record television programming. The computer system must have enough CPU power, adequate RAM, and a high-speed storage system to support the capture, recording, and editing demands of the customer. 
Choose the correct capture card based on your customer's current and future needs. For example, if a customer wants to record one program while watching another, either multiple capture cards or a capture card with multiple TV tuners must be installed. Adapter cards are inserted into two types of expansion slots on a motherboard. Peripheral Component Interconnect, PCI, PCI is commonly available to support older expansion cards. PCI Express, PCIe, PCIe has four types of slots, X1, X4, X8, and X16. These PCIe slots vary in length from shortest, X1, to longest, X16, respectively. Note, if the motherboard does not have a compatible expansion slot, an external device may be an option. A tabbed content container. Content can be text, graphic, or both. Select the tabs for a view of the different expansion slots. PCI. PCIe X1. PCIe X16. PCIe. PCI, PCIe X1, PCIe X16, Incomplete 2.1.5.3 Other Factors for Adapter Card Selection 2.1.5.3 Other Factors for Adapter Card Selection Slideshow, Select the Next Button to Progress Select the arrows to for a picture and more information factors to consider when purchasing new adapter cards. Other factors for adapter card selection. Before purchasing an adapter card, consider the following questions. What are the user's current and future needs? Is there an open and compatible expansion slot available? What are the possible configuration options? Graphics card Slot type Amount and speed of video RAM, VRAM Graphics processor unit, GPU Maximum resolution Incomplete 2.1.5.4 Install the adapter cards 2.1.5 2.1.5.4 install. Select the arrows to for a picture and more information factors to consider when purchasing new adapter cards. Sound card. Slot type. Digital signal processor, DSP. Port and connection types. Signal to noise ratio. Incomplete 2.1.2.1.5.4 in st Storage controller card Slot type Connector quantity Internal or external connectors Card size Controller card RAM Controller card processor. RAID type. Incomplete 2.1.5. I.O. card. Slot ratio. I.O. port type. I.O. port quantity. Additional power requirements. Incomplete 2.1.5. Slot type. Slot type.
NIC. Slot type. Speed. Connector type. Wired or wireless connection. Standards compatibility. Incomplete 2.1.5.4 install the adapter cards. Capture card. Storage. Resolution and frame rate. I.O. port. Format standards. Input interface types. Incomplete 2.1.5.4 install the adapter cards. 2.1.5.4 install the adapter cards. Expansion cards are installed into an empty but appropriate slot on a computer motherboard. For example, a wireless NIC enables a computer to connect to a wireless Wi-Fi network. Wireless NICs can be integrated into the motherboard, connected using a USB connector, or installed using a PCI or PCIe expansion slots on the motherboard. Many video adapter cards require separate power from the power supply using a 6-pin or 8-pin power connector. Some cards may need two of these connectors. If possible, provide some space between the video adapter and other expansion cards. Video adapters create excessive heat, which is often moved away from the card with a fan. Installation tip, research the length of the video card and other adapter cards before purchase. Longer cards may not be compatible with certain motherboards. Chips and other electronics may stand in the way of the adapter card when trying to seat them in the expansion slot. Some cases might also limit the size of adapter cards that can be installed. Some adapter cards may come with mounting brackets of different heights to accommodate these cases. Installation tip. Some cases have small slots at the bottom of the hole where the cover was removed. Slide the bottom of the mounting bracket into this slot before seating the card. Card Incomplete 2.1.5.5 Check your understanding, installing adapter cards. 2.1.5.5 Check your understanding, installing adapter cards. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the step number to the description. Secure the adapter card mounting bracket to the case with the appropriate screw. Press down gently on the adapter card until the card is fully seated. Find an empty expansion slot and remove the small metal cover. Align the adapter card to the appropriate slot on the motherboard. 1 2 3 4 Submit. Submit. Show feedback. Incomplete 2.1.5.6 Lab Install Adapter Cards. 2.1.5.6 Lab Install Adapter Cards. In this lab, you will install a NIC, a wireless NIC, and a video adapter card. Install adapter cards. Lab install adapter cards. Install adapter cards. Introduction. 
In this lab, you will install a NIC, a wireless NIC, and a video adapter card. Recommended equipment. Computer with power supply, motherboard, and drives installed. NIC. Wireless NIC. Video adapter card. Adapter card screws. Anti-static wrist strap and anti-static mat. Toolkit. Motherboard manual. Instructions. Step 1. Install the wired NIC. Question. What type of expansion slot is compatible with the NIC? Type your answers here. Locate a compatible expansion slot for the NIC on the motherboard. Remove the slot cover from the back of the case, if necessary. Align the NIC to the expansion slot. Press down gently on the NIC until the card is fully seated. Secure the NIC by attaching the PC mounting bracket to the case with a screw. Step 2. Install the wireless NIC. Question. What type of expansion slot is compatible with the wireless NIC? Type your answers here. Locate a compatible expansion slot for the wireless NIC on the motherboard. Remove the slot cover from the back of the case, if necessary. Align the wireless NIC to the expansion slot. Press down gently on the wireless NIC until the card is fully seated. Secure the wireless NIC by attaching the PC mounting bracket to the case with a screw. 2015 to 2019 Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco public page 1 of 2 www.nitacad.com. Lab install adapter cards. Step 3. Install the video adapter card. Question. What type of expansion slot is compatible with the video adapter card? Type your answers here. Locate a compatible expansion slot for the video adapter card on the motherboard. Remove the slot covers from the back of the case, if necessary. Align the video adapter card to the expansion slot. Press down gently on the video adapter card until the card is fully seated. Secure the video adapter card by attaching the PC mounting brackets to the case with a screw. This lab is complete. Please have the instructor verify your work. End of document. Cards. Incomplete 2.1.6 Select Additional Storage. Incomplete 2.1.6.1 Select a Media Reader. 2.1.6.1 Select a Media Reader. Many digital devices such as cameras, smartphones, and tablets use media cards to store information, music, pictures, videos, data, and more. Several media card formats have been developed over the years including Secure Digital, SD, SD cards were designed for use in portable devices such as cameras, MP3 players, and laptops. SD cards can hold as much as 2 terabytes of data. MicroSD, this is a much smaller version of SD, commonly used in smartphones and tablets. Mini SD, a version of SD between the size of an SD card and a micro SD card. The format was developed for mobile phones. Compact Flash, Compact Flash is an older format, but still in wide use because of its high speed and high capacity, up to 128 GB is common. Compact Flash is often used as storage for video cameras. Memory Stick, created by Sony Corporation, Memory Stick is a proprietary flash memory used in cameras, MP3 players, handheld video game systems, mobile phones, cameras, and other portable electronics. XD, 
Also known as picture card, it was used in some digital cameras. A tabbed content container. Content can be text, graphic, or both. Select a tab to view a picture of a common media card. SD. Micro SD. Mini SD. SD. Micro SD. Mini SD. Compact flash. Compact Flash It is useful to have an internal or external device that can be used to read or write to media cards. When purchasing or replacing a media reader, ensure that it supports the types of media cards that will be used. The following figure displays an external media card reader and lists factors to consider when purchasing a media reader. Choose the correct media reader based on your customer's current and future needs. For example, if a customer needs to use multiple types of media cards, a multiple format media reader is needed. New media reader factors. Media cards supported. Internal or external. Size. Connector type. Complete 2.1.6.2 Select External Storage 2.1.6.2 Select External Storage External storage offers portability and convenience when working with multiple computers. External USB flash drives, sometimes called thumb drives, are commonly used as removable external storage. External storage devices connect to an external port using USB, eSATA, or Thunderbolt ports. The figure displays an external flash drive and lists factors to consider when purchasing an external storage solution. Choose the correct type of external storage for your customer's needs. For example, if your customer needs to transfer a small amount of data, such as a single presentation, an external flash drive is a good choice. If your customer needs to back up or transfer large amounts of data, choose an external hard drive. New external storage factors. Port type. Storage capacity. Speed. Portability. Power Requirements Incomplete 2.1.6.3 Check your understanding, media cards. 2.1.6.3 Check your understanding, media cards. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the media card to the respective description. Compact flash. Mini SD. Micro SD. Memory stick. This is a proprietary flash memory used in cameras, MP3 players, and handheld video game systems. This is the smallest of the SD card formats and is commonly used in smartphones and tablets. This is the medium size SD card format that was developed for mobile phones. This is an older format but still used in cameras because of its high speed and capacity. Incomplete 2.1.7 Install the cables. Complete 2.1.7.1 Video Demonstration Connect the Internal Power Cables 2.1.7.1 Video Demonstration Connect the Internal Power Cables 
Select Play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Incomplete 2.1.7.2 Hello everyone, this is our Install the Power Connector video. This is going to be a two-part video. The first part, we're going to install the power connectors on the motherboard. Step one, we need to align our 24-pin connector with the socket on the motherboard. There's our socket, and here's our 24-pin connector. But step one, aligning it means we need this clip to connect on the outside of that connector. So we can go ahead and we can align it with that connector. Now that it's aligned, step two, we're going to gently press down on the connector until that clip locks into place. As we press down, you hear it click into place. Step three, we need to align our four pin power connector for auxiliary power on the motherboard, which we'll see here also has a clip with its corresponding connector on the motherboard. To align it, I'll just drop it in on top. And then, step four, we're going to gently press down on that connector until it clicks into place. And now it clicked into place. Step five, we need to take our CPU fan with its power connector right here. And we need to align this correctly, which you'll see the little slot here. We need to align that correctly with the actual CPU fan slot on the motherboard, which is right here. Step six, we're going to gently press down on it and put it in place. It doesn't click, it just slides in, and we are done. In part two of our video, we're going to install the power connector for our SATA hard drive. Now this is our two and a half inch solid state hard drive. On the back, we're going to have a data port and a power port. So we can take a zoom in here and see a closer view. The larger port here is going to be the power connector. And this is going to be our 15 pin SATA power connector. So step one, we're going to take our power connector that's going to attach to the drive. And here's what it looks like right here. We can see it's keyed in a specific way, so you cannot install it upside down. And we need to align it correctly with the SATA hard drive. When we have it aligned correctly, we can take it and line it up right here. And step two is we're going to gently push it in until it's fully seated. Awesome. Now that we have the SATA 15 pin power connector installed, we're going to install the power connector for our case fan. This is going to be a three pin power connector that we'll connect to on the motherboard. The power connector looks exactly like this. It's got a spot for three pins. The connector on the motherboard that we're going to hook it to is right below here and it is brown. We'll zoom in and take a closer look at that power connector. So as you see right here, that's going to be the three pin power connector and we're going to connect it in. Step one, we need to align the power connector to the motherboard. Again, this power connector has a slot, just like we saw previously for the CPU fan. So step two, we're going to press it in gently now that we have it aligned. And that is what it looks like when it is installed correctly. Thank you for watching our Installing the Power Connectors video. Two dot one dot seven dot two check your understanding, identify the power connectors. Matching. Select from lists and then submit. Match the power connector type to the respective image.
ATX Auxiliary. ATX Motherboard. SATA. Molux. H. Submit. Show feedback. Complete 2.1.7.3 video demonstration. Connect the internal data cables. 2.1.7.3 video demonstration. Connect the internal data cables. Select play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello everyone. Welcome to our install the data connectors video. First, we want to take a look at our motherboard and find those SATA data connectors. They're down here. I've got four of them. Also, on my solid state hard drive, I've got the SATA power connector that we installed previously, but I removed it so we can see that SATA data connector, which is the smaller of the two on this side. So to get started, step one, we need to align our SATA data cable and it's notched to fit exactly down below. So we'll align it. And then after it's aligned, we can just gently push it in and it will click into place. Step two, we'll take our right angle SATA data cable here and we're going to connect it with its corresponding connector on our hard drive. So we align it up, then we can press it in. And it clicks into place. Awesome. Thank you for watching our Connecting the Data Cables video. Incomplete 2.1.7.4 Lab Install Internal Cables 2.1.7.4 Lab Install Internal Cables In this lab, install the internal power and data cables in the computer. Install Internal Cables Lab Install Internal Cables Introduction In this lab, install the internal power and data cables in the computer. Recommended Equipment Computer with power supply, motherboard, drives, and adapter cards installed. Hard disk drive data cable Optical drive data cable Anti-static wrist, strap, and anti-static mat Toolkit Motherboard Manual Instructions Step 1. Connect the Motherboard Power Supply Connector Align the Motherboard Power Supply Connector to the socket on the motherboard. Gently press down on the connector until the clip clicks into place. Step 2. Connect the Auxiliary Power Connector Align the auxiliary power connector to the auxiliary power socket on the motherboard.
gently press down on the connector until the clip clicks into place. Note, this step is necessary only if your computer has an auxiliary power connector. Step 3. Connect the internal disk drive power connectors. Plug a power connector into the hard disk drive and the optical drive. Step 4. Connect the video adapter card power cable. Plug the PCIe power connector to the video adapter card. Note, this step is necessary only if your video adapter card has a PCIe power connector. Step 5. Connect the fan power connector. Connect the fan power connector into the appropriate fan header on the motherboard. Note, this step is necessary only if your computer has a fan power connector. Step 6. Connect the hard disk data cable. Align and plug the hard disk drive data cable into the motherboard connector. Align and plug the other end of the hard disk drive data cable into the hard disk drive connector. Note, SATA cables are keyed to ensure correct orientation with the connector. 2015 to 2019 Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco Public Page 1 of 2 www.nitacad.com Lab Install Internal Cables Step 7. Connect the Optical Drive Data Cable Align and plug the Optical Drive Data Cable into the motherboard connector. Align and plug the other end of the Optical Drive Data Cable into the Optical Drive Connector. Step 8. Verify the Connections this lab is complete. Please have the instructor verify your work. End of document. Two dot one dot seven dot five video demonstration install the front panel cables. Select play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello everyone. Here we get to install front panel connectors. This is going to include audio connectors, as well as power switch, reset switch, hard drive activity lights. So to get started, we're going to use a different board, just because the other board was more proprietary for a specific vendor. This will be better. To start it off, what we're going to see here is that down the left corner, we'll zoom in on this in a little bit, we're going to have our front panel audio. And down in the bottom right corner, we're going to have our front panel connectors. So first, we're going to take a look at the front panel audio. So we have a zoomed in view of the front panel pins for our audio connector. And what you can see here is that we have nine pins. It looks like one of them is missing, but it's not missing. That's just because it's a keyed slot. If we take a look at the actual connector that's coming off of the front panel that we're going to plug in, it's this. This is an HD audio connector. And the HD audio connector, if we take a look at the actual holes, look at that. We've got that same keyed format where we've got that one that's going to be missing and, you know, the orientation for the motherboard. So all we need to do is slide this back onto those pins and we'll have this up and running. So we've got our audio connector connected to our motherboard and now we're going to move over to the front panel. So let's take a closer look at the front panel connectors on the motherboard. Here they are at the bottom right corner. What we'll see here is power LED, as well as hard drive LED, power switch, speaker, which is not your normal speaker, that's your errors and think BIOS and boot up issues, and a reset switch. What we need to do is take these connectors that are coming off of the front panel of our tower and we need to hook them accordingly. Well, how do you know what goes where and what orientation? That's where you consult your manual. Bing, my manual is here. So you can see my diagram for how I need to connect these, and that's what we're going to do next. So what we'll do first is we're going to take the power LEDs, 
and that's going to be these two right here. And we'll take these power LEDs and we'll put them in the correct orientation. According to our picture, the positive one is going to go on the left to this pin, and the negative one will go here on the next pin over on the right. So I'll do that. And what you'll notice is there is a gap between those two, and that's okay. That's a blank slot. Again, it's keyed. Next, what we want to do is go ahead and do the power switch. That power switch is hiding underneath here. There we go. This is the power switch. And the power switch is going to go right here where you see the power switch one, PWRSW. Same thing for this. We don't have to worry about a positive or negative. We just need to drop this thing on that power switch. Power switch is installed. Next, we're going to do the reset. So we'll find the reset switch, which is this one right here. And reset needs to go on these two, as it shows in our diagram. The reset switch is now installed. And lastly, we're going to set up and do the hard drive LED. Hard drive LED, according to our diagram, is the bottom left corner. And our front panel connectors are now installed. So it's all installed. That's awesome. If we had any USB connectors, we'd pop them in and plug them straight into these keyed USB ports, and it would be fine for those as well. My system does not have those for this motherboard and this case that I'm utilizing, so we don't have to drop those in. Now, take care and practice putting these connectors on, and make sure you take the time to find the manual so you know how to do it properly. You're one step closer to being an IT professional and doing one of the hardest parts of hooking up a motherboard inside of a computer case. Complete 2.1.7.6 Install the front panel cables. 2.1.7.6 Install the front panel cables. A computer case typically has a power button and visible activity lights on the front of the case. The case will include front panel cables that must be connected to a common system panel connector on a motherboard. A tabbed content container. Content can be text, graphic, or both. Select the tabs for picture of front panel connectors and connections. Front panel connectors. Front panel connectors. System panel connector. System panel connectors include System panel connector Writing on the motherboard near the system panel connector shows where each cable is connected. Connected. Front panel connectors. Power button. The power button turns the computer on or off. If the power button fails to turn off the computer, hold down the power button for several, i.e. five or more, seconds. System panel connectors include Power button. The power button turns the computer on or off. 
If the power button fails to turn off the computer, hold down the power button for several, i.e. 5 or more, seconds. Reset button. The reset button, if available, restarts the computer without turning it off. Power LED. The power LED remains lit when the computer is on and often blinks when the computer is in sleep mode. Drive activity LEDs. The drive activity LED remains lit or blinks when the system is reading or writing to hard drives. System speaker. The motherboard uses a case speaker, if available, to indicate the computer's status. For example, one beep indicates that the computer started without problems. If there is a hardware problem, a series of diagnostic beeps is issued to indicate the type of problem. It is important to note that the system speaker is not the same as the speakers the computer uses to play music and other audio. The system speaker cable typically uses four pins on the system panel connector. Audio. Some cases have audio ports and jacks on the outside to connect microphones, external audio equipment such as signal processors, mixing boards, and instruments. Special audio panels can also be purchased and connected directly to the motherboard. These panels can install into one or more external drive bays or be standalone panels. System panel connectors are not keyed. However, each front panel cable usually has a small arrow indicating pin 1, and each pair of LED pins on the motherboard system panel connector has pin 1 marked with a plus sign, plus symbol. A tabbed content container. Content can be text, graphic, or both. Select each tab to see a picture of pin 1 locations. Pin 1 arrow indicator. System panel connector pin 1 indicator. Pin 1 arrow indicator. System panel connector pin 1 indicator. Note, the markings on your front panel cables and system panel connectors may be different than what is shown as no standards for labeling the case cables or the system panel connectors are defined. Always consult the motherboard manual for diagrams and additional information about connecting front panel cables. New cases and motherboards have USB 3.0 or may even have USB 3.1 capabilities. The USB 3.0 and 3.1 motherboard connector is similar in design to a USB connector, but has additional pins. USB connector cables are often 9 or 10 pins arranged in two rows. These cables connect to USB motherboard connectors. A tabbed content container. Content can be text, graphic, or both. Select each tab for a picture of motherboard USB connections and an internal USB connector. USB motherboard connectors. USB motherboard connectors. Internal USB connector. This arrangement allows for two USB connections, so USB connectors are often in pairs. Sometimes the two connectors are together in one piece, as shown in the figure, and can be connected to the entire USB motherboard connector. USB connectors can also have 4 or 5 pins or individual groups of 4 or 5 pins. Most USB devices only require the connection of 4 pins. The fifth pin is used to ground the shielding of some USB cables. Caution! Make sure that the motherboard connector is marked USB. Firewire connectors are very similar. Connecting a USB cable to a firewire connector will cause damage. The following table provides connecting notes on various front panel connections.
Incomplete 2.1.7.6 Table 3 Front Panel Incomplete 2.1.7.6 Table 3 Front Panel Cable Connection Specifics Front panel. Connection specifics. Power button. Align pin one of the two pin front panel power button cable with the power button pins on the motherboard. Reset button. Align pin one of the two pin front panel reset button cable with the reset button pins on the motherboard. Power LED. Align pin one of the front panel power LED cable with the power LED pins on the motherboard. Drive activity LED. Align pin one of the front panel drive activity cable with the drive activity pins on the motherboard. System speaker. Align pin one of the front panel system speaker cable with the system speaker pins on the motherboard. Audio cables. Due to the specialized function and variety of the hardware, consult the motherboard, case, and audio panel documentation for specific instructions. USB. Align pin one of the USB cable with the USB pins on the motherboard. Generally, if a button or LED does not function, the connector is incorrectly oriented. To correct this, shut down the computer and unplug it, open the case, and turn the connector around for the button or LED that does not function. To avoid wiring incorrectly, some manufacturers include a keyed pin extender that combines multiple front panel cables, i.e. power and reset LEDs, connectors into one connector. Installation tip, the panel connector and case cable ends are very small. Take pictures of them to locate pin 1. Because space in the case can be limited at the end of assembly, a part retriever can be used to plug the cables into the connectors. Incomplete 2.1.7.7 Check your understanding. Identify the front panel cables. 2.1.7.7 Check your understanding. Identify the front panel cables. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Choose the correct front panel connector for each description. Restarts the computer without turning it off. Turns the computer on or off. Often consist on 9 or 10 pins arranged in two rows, but can also have 4 or 5 pins or individual groups of 4 or 5 piece. Connects ports for jacks on the outside to connect microphones or external equipment, such as signal processors, mixing boards, and instruments. Remains lit when the computer is on, and often blinks when the computer is in sleep mode. Used to audibly indicate the computer's status. If there is a hardware problem, a series of diagnostic beeps is issued to indicate the type of problem. Remains lit or blinks when the system is reading or writing data. System speaker. Power button. USB Power LED Audio Drive Activity LEDs Reset button Submit Incomplete 2.1.7.8 Lab Install the front panel cables 2.1.7.8 Lab Install the front panel cables in this lab, you will install the front panel cables in the computer. Install the front panel cables.
Lab Install Front Panel Cables Introduction In this lab, install the front panel cables in the computer. Recommended Equipment Computer with power supply, motherboard, drives, and adapter cards installed. Anti-static wrist, strap, and anti-static mat. Toolkit. Motherboard manual. Instructions. Step 1. Connect the reset switch connector. Gently press down on the reset switch connector until the pins are fully inserted. Step 2. Connect the power switch connector. Gently press down on the power switch connector until the pins are fully inserted. Step 3. Connect the power LED connector. Gently press down on the power LED connector until the pins are fully inserted. Step 4. Connect the HDD LED connector. Gently press down on the HDD LED connector until the pins are fully inserted. Step 5. Connect the speaker connector. Gently press down on the speaker connector until the pins are fully inserted. Step 6. Connect the USB and front audio jacks. If your case also has front USB and front audio jacks, gently press down on the connector until the clip clicks into place or the pins are fully inserted. Step 7. Verify the connections. Note, if any LED or switch does not work when the computer is first started, remove the connector for that item, turn it around, and reconnect it. End of document. Two dot one dot seven dot eight lab install the front panel cables. In this lab, you will install the front panel cables in the computer. Two dot one dot seven dot nine video demonstration complete the computer assembly. Click play in the figure to view a demonstration of how to reassemble the case and install the external cables. Click here to read the transcript of this video. This is a media player component. Select the play slash pause button to watch or listen. Press the play button to view this short demo video. Hello everyone! In this video we're going to reassemble our case and then we're going to install our external cables. To get started we have the front of our tower here and we'll put on our front cover. Now remember the front cover just had these locking clips on the side so we just need to line it up and all we need to do is push down in the corners. And now the front case is locked. We've got our USB ports, our headphone, and our mic port. Also on the front here we also have our DVD disk drive that we installed. I can turn this on its face. And now we can do our external cables. So for this part I'll take off my anti-static wrist strap. And I can take my power cord. And I can just slide the plug in here. And you shouldn't have to force any one of these cables as you install the cables to the back of your tower. I've got a USB for my keyboard. These you do have to align. So take a close look regarding how you need to align it. You'll see the correct end to slide in. And I have another USB. So this is my keyboard mouse combo. And again, we'll take a look at the alignment of the USB and plug it in. Also at this time, I have my graphics cable. For me, I have a DVI connection. The DVI is going to go to my white port here on my graphics card we had installed. So I'll plug that in. And we've got two screws on that. We can just easily screw it until it's snug. You don't need to over tighten these. It's not going to fall out. Lastly, I have an audio cable and I have my network jack. I'll plug in my network jack to my Ethernet port. Then my audio cable is green for my speakers out. And I'll plug that in my green speaker out port. Our external cables are installed. Last thing, we take a look at the side. It's still open. We need to close it off with the cover. 
with the cover. It's just going to slide on. You can see the slots here along the top that we're going to lock it into. I'm just going to rest it in. You can shift it and feel it to slide into place. And then there should be no force really needed here. You just slowly slide it forward. Then I have my locking screw. But you know, I can just close that by hand. And then I can give it a little bit of a snug tighten. And again, we don't need to over tighten that. And now we're done. Our case is put back together. It is ready to go. Thank you for watching our video. Incomplete 2.1.7.10 Check your understanding. Identify the external connectors. 2.1.7.10 Check your understanding. Identify the external connectors. Matching. Select from lists and then submit. Match the connector type to the respective image. Power. USB. Power. Mouse. Monitor. Submit. Incomplete 2.1.7.11 Lab. Complete the computer assembly. 2.1.7.11 Lab, complete the computer assembly. In this lab, you will install the side panels and the external cables on the computer. Complete the computer assembly. Lab, complete the computer assembly. Introduction In this lab, you will install the side panels and the external cables on the computer. Recommended equipment Computer with power supply, motherboard, drives, and adapter cards installed, and internal cables connected. Monitor cable, HDMI, DVI, or VGA. Keyboard Mouse Network cable Wireless antenna Power cable Toolkit Motherboard manual Instructions Step 1. Attach the side panels Attach the side panels to the computer case Secure the side panels to the computer using the panel screws Step 2. Attach the monitor cable. Attach the monitor cable to the video port. Secure the cable by tightening the screws on the connector. Step 3. Attach the keyboard cable. Plug the keyboard cable into the USB or PS-2 keyboard port. Step 4. Attach the mouse cable. Plug the mouse cable into the USB or PS-2 mouse port. Port. Step 5. Attach the Ethernet cable. Plug the Ethernet cable into the Ethernet port. Step 6. Attach the wireless antenna. 
Connect the wireless antenna to the antenna connector. Step 7. Attach the power cable. Plug the power cable into the power socket of the power supply. 2000. Lab, complete the computer assembly. Step 8. Verify connections. This lab is complete. Please have the instructor verify your work. End of document. Previous. Home. Next. 2.2 Summary Scroll to begin Incomplete 2.2.1 Conclusion Incomplete 2.2.1.1 Chapter 2 PC Assembly 2.2.1.1 Chapter 2 PC Assembly in this chapter you learn that assembling computers is often a large part of a technician's job and that as a technician, you must work in a logical, methodical manner when working with computer components. For example, the choice of motherboard and external components influences the selection of the case and power supply and the motherboard form factor must be matched with the correct type of computer case and power supply. You learned that PC power supplies convert AC input to DC output voltages. Power supplies typically provide voltages of 3.3V, 5V, and 12V to power the various internal components of the computer and that the power supply must have the proper connectors for the motherboard and the various types of devices to be powered. After learning about power supplies, you install the power supply as well as other internal components including a CPU and RAM. You learn that when you select a motherboard it must support the CPU, RAM, video adapter, and other adapter cards and that the socket and chipset on the motherboard must be compatible with the CPU. The motherboard sockets may be designed to support Intel CPUs, which support an LGA architecture, or AMD CPUs, which support a PGA architecture. In addition to learning about CPU architectures, you also learned that when selecting new RAM, it must be compatible with the motherboard and that the speed of the RAM must be supported by the chipset. You then performed labs where you installed a CPU, a heat sink slash fan assembly, and RAM modules on the motherboard. You also installed the motherboard assembly into the computer case. Next, you learned about the various types of storage drives, such as internal drives, external drives, hard disk drives, solid state drives, and optical drives, and the factors to consider when selecting the appropriate drive. You then installed drives in the computer case. Finally, you learned about adapter cards, which are also called expansion cards or add-on cards. There are many types of adapter cards and each is designed for a specific task and to add extra functionality to a computer. The chapter covered graphics cards, sound cards, storage controllers, I.O. cards, and NICs. These adapter cards are inserted into two types of expansion slots on a motherboard, PCI and PCIe. At the end of the chapter, there were labs where you installed an adapter card, connected the appropriate internal power cables, front panel connectors, and performed final computer assembly. Incomplete 2.2.1.2 PC Assembly 2.2.1.2 PC Assembly Incomplete Question 1 Multiple choice question. Which two pieces of information are needed before selecting a power supply? Choose two. Incomplete question two.
Multiple choice question. What should be done prior to the installation of RAM onto the motherboard? Multiple choice question. Which adapter card in a PC would provide data fault tolerance? In Incomplete question 4. Multiple choice question. What is a possible hardware upgrade that can be used to add more storage space to a modern smartphone? Incomplete question 5. Multiple choice question. The following parts were ordered by someone building a personal computer. 1. AMD 3.7 GHz 2. GigaWiz GA. A 239VM does not include USB 3.1 front panel connectors, 3, Horsair DDR3 8GB 4, ATX with up to 3 3.5-inch drive base 5, Eastern Divide 1TB 7200 RPM 6. Zoltz 550W. What is the significance of the 550W in the sixth item? Zoltz 550W. W.R. Incomplete question 6. Multiple choice question. Refer to the exhibit. A technician is installing a second SATA hard drive. Which section of the motherboard will be used to connect the SATA cable? Incomplete question 7. Incomplete question 8. Multiple choice question. Which SATA internal hard drive form factor is most often used in a tower computer? Incomplete question 8. Multiple choice question. A technician is being asked to move a heavy industrial printer. Which safety technique is recommended for this situation? Incomplete question 9. Multiple choice question. What should a technician do before working on a computer? Incomplete question 10. Ten. Multiple choice question. A technician needs to buy a replacement adapter for a department computer. Which type of adapter requires the technician to consider a DSP? Incomplete question 11. Multiple choice question. What are two reasons someone might upgrade a NIC? Incomplete question 12. Multiple choice question. Which type of media card is an older format but is still used in video cameras? Question 13. Multiple choice question. 
Refer to the exhibit. Which front panel connector commonly has 9 or 10 pins arranged in two rows? Multiple question. Complete question 14. Multiple choice question. True or false? When installing a hard drive, it is recommended that you hand tighten drive mounting screws prior to using a screwdriver. Click. Click Submit if you are happy with your answers above. Above. Submit. Two point two summary. Summary. You've submitted your answers. Reset. Review assessment. 100%. Assessment results. You've scored 100%. Congratulations, you have passed the test.
IT Essentials Internet Connection, Getting Online, Module 3, Advanced Computer Hardware Module 1, Introduction to Personal Computer Hardware Three point zero Introduction to Advanced Computer Hardware. Scroll to begin. Incomplete three point zero point one Introduction. Incomplete three dot zero dot one dot one Welcome. Three dot zero dot one dot one Welcome. A technician's knowledge must extend beyond knowing how to assemble a computer. You need to have in-depth knowledge of computer system architecture and how each component operates and interacts with other components. This depth of knowledge is necessary when you have to upgrade a computer with new components that must be compatible with existing components and also when you build computers for very specialized applications. This chapter covers the computer boot process, protecting the computer from power fluctuations, multi-core processors, redundancy through multiple storage drives, and protecting the environment from hazardous materials found inside of computer components. You will learn about the computer boot process including the power on self-test, post, conducted by the BIOS. Explore various BIOS and UEFI settings and how they impact this process. You will explore basic electrical theory and Ohm's law and calculate voltage, current, resistance, and power. Power fluctuations can damage computer components so you will learn how to mitigate the risk of power fluctuations with surge protectors, uninterruptible power supplies, UPSs, and standby power supplies, SPSs. You will learn how to provide storage redundancy and load balancing using redundant arrays of independent disks, RAID. You will also learn how to upgrade computer components and configure specialized computers. Finally, after upgrading a computer, technicians must dispose of the old parts properly. Many computer components contain hazardous materials, such as mercury and rare earth metals in batteries and deadly voltage levels in power supplies. You will learn the risks posed by these components and how to dispose of them properly. In this chapter, there is a lab where you research hardware upgrades to a computer system. You will use several sources to gather information about the computer hardware components and make recommendations for upgraded components. You will also discuss your recommended upgrade choices. Home Next Three point one boot the computer. Scroll to begin. Incomplete 3.1.1 Post, BIOS, CMOS, and UEFI. Complete 3.1.1.1 Video Demonstration, BIOS, UEFI Menus. 3.1.1.1 Video Demonstration, BIOS, UEFI Menus. Select Play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Have you ever heard about the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface? Maybe not, but I bet you have heard of a UEFI BIOS. Well, UEFI stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. We're going to kick it off here and investigate the UEFI BIOS. I'll do the investigating you'll get the tour. Let's begin. So my computer here has just booted into the UEFI BIOS. Every computer is a little bit different and may require different keystrokes in order to access the BIOS. For example, my computer required me to press the delete key after I first turned it on. So here we are. This is a real BIOS, not a simulated BIOS. In the top left corner, you can see my motherboard's model number. Awesome. And my CPU temperature. 
Right below that, you can even see my motherboard temperature. In the middle here, we can actually see our system time and date. Right below that, we can see the current firmware of my UEFI BIOS. What I really enjoy though is in the top right corner of the screen where you see these listed items here in the top. Here you can view my current CPU, which has four CPU cores and six GPU cores. You can view the operating frequency for both my CPU and my RAM. You can also see the total size of the RAM that I have installed in my system. Now remember, this is the UEFI BIOS. What that means is I have a graphical user interface that includes keyboard and mouse support. This is very different from what we've seen with legacy BIOS. To further demonstrate this, look at this horizontal bar right below my system time and date and my CPU and RAM. From left to right, this is my boot order of my computer. What's even more awesome is the fact that I can drag and drop these items anywhere. We will focus on configuration of this though in another video. So let's take a quick look inside the UFI BIOS. Let's start by investigating the left side of the screen. Here we will find that we have an area for motherboard settings, overclocking our system for faster performance, and an area called M-Flash, which allows us to flash our system with an updated UFI BIOS. Now on the right side of the screen, we have a section that where we can choose different overclocking profiles. We can pre-build these for the right gaming or video editing occasion. Down below that, we have a hardware monitor where we can check out the power usage and cooling. We can even have customized fan speeds and even view graphs here. And lastly, we can visit the Board Explorer. The Board Explorer is awesome because this allows us to have a beautiful and interactive view of what's actually attached to our motherboard. So it's time for the deeper look. So first we'll head over to settings. In settings, we can look at system settings, which I can either click on with a mouse or click the enter key. And inside of here we see time and date, as well as in text, what's connected to my motherboard and the firmware version. We next are going to have the advanced area. In the advanced area, we can do a lot of fine tuning and control of both the peripherals and the power settings of our motherboard. Another item we can customize is going to be the boot settings. So I'll head back out and go to boot. This is extremely important. This allows us to customize the boot order of our system, both using device preference and security settings known as secure boot. We we'll take a look at that later on. If we go into the security settings though, we can take a look here and see that we have the ability to set an administrator password. This will prevent other people from accessing and modifying our UFI bio settings. Now let's get out of the settings area and let's go all the way over and see overclock. We'll take a quick look at the overclock settings and you can see all the customizations possible here. This allows you to fine tune your machine for the performance that you desire. But our UFI bio settings. Now let's get out of the settings area and let's go all the way over and see overclock. We'll take a quick look at the overclock settings and you can see all the customizations possible here. This allows you to fine tune your machine for the performance that you desire. But this may cause some extra wear and tear in your system due to increased heat. Next, we will have the M flash section. This is where you can utilize tools in order to flash your UEFI BIOS with the latest firmware. This is commonly done with a USB key or flash drive plugged in. Not too much. Heading to the right side, we'll go over to our overclocking profiles. This is where we can pick what overclocking profile to use that we have pre-built and saved for a given situation. This should be good for gaming or video editing, or maybe even normal computing use. Last two sections. We'll take a trip into the hardware monitor. Here we can look at the CPU fan speed, temperature, as well as case fan speeds. Some UFI will even allow you to set an average temperature you'd like your system to stay at, and your cooling fans will react accordingly to do their best to keep your system as close to that target temperature as possible. Love it. We'll back up and take a look at that board explorer. I click on the board explorer. This is great. In the board explorer, you can get a graphical view of your motherboard. The highlighted sections allow you to hover your mouse over them and read a description of what is connected to that component. For example, if I were to take my mouse cursor and I can hover over the RAM slot where my memory is, 
I can actually see information regarding it. You can see that each RAM slot has a 4 gig memory chip installed. Also, if I hover over my SATA ports, we'll get information on what is connected to that individual SATA port. You can see that I have two SATA devices attached. One of these is my device here, and the other one is Blu-ray disc DVD ROM drive. This is a great UEFI tool to visually see how the motherboard is arranged and what is connected to your machine without even opening the case. So if you have time to take, get into your BIOS and view your settings and learn how your device is connected and running. When a computer is booted, the basic input, output, Three dot one dot one dot two post. Three dot one dot one dot two post. When a computer is booted, the basic input output system BIOS performs a hardware check on the main components of the computer. This check is called a power on self test post. The figure below displays a screen capture of a sample post being performed. Notice how the computer checks whether the computer hardware is operating correctly. Incomplete 3.1.1.2 Table 1 Common Beep Codes Beep Code Meaning Cause one beep, no video. Memory refresh failure. Bad memory. Two beeps. Memory parity error. Bad memory. Three beeps. Base 64 MEM failure. Bad memory. Four beeps. Timer not operational. Bad motherboard. 5 beeps. Processor error. Bad processor. 6 beeps. 8042 gate A20 failure. Bad CPU or motherboard. 7 beeps. Processor exception. Bad processor. 8 beeps. Video memory error. Bad video card or memory. 9 beeps. Wrong checksum error. Bad BIOS. 10 beeps. CMOS checksum error. Bad motherboard. 11 beeps. Cache memory bad. Bad CPU or motherboard. If a device is malfunctioning, an error or a beep code alerts the technician of the problem. If there is a hardware problem, a blank screen might appear at boot up and the computer will emit a series of beeps. BIOS manufacturers use different codes to indicate hardware problems. The table below shows a chart of common beep codes. However, motherboard manufacturers may use different beep codes. Always consult the motherboard documentation to get the beep codes for your computer. Installation tip. To determine if POST is working properly, remove all of the RAM modules from the computer and power it on. The computer should emit the beep code for a computer with no RAM installed. This will not harm the computer. Incomplete 3.1.1.3 BIOS and CMOS. 3.1.1.3 BIOS and CMOS. All motherboards need BIOS to operate. BIOS is a ROM chip on the motherboard that contains a small program. This program controls the communication between the operating system and the hardware. Along with the POST, BIOS also identifies 
Which drives are available? Which drives are bootable? How the memory is configured and when it can be used. How PCIe and PCI expansion slots are configured. How SATA and USB ports are configured. Motherboard power management features. The motherboard manufacturer saves the motherboard BIOS settings in a complementary metal oxide semiconductor CMOS, memory chip such as the one shown below. When a computer boots, the BIOS software reads the configured settings stored in CMOS to determine how to configure the hardware. The BIOS settings are retained by CMOS using a battery such as the one shown in the figure below. However, if the battery fails, important settings can be lost. Therefore, it is recommended that BIOS settings always be documented. Note, an easy way to document these settings is to take pictures of the various BIOS settings. Installation tip, if the computer's time and date are incorrect, it could indicate that the CMOS battery is bad or is getting very low. Incomplete 3.1.1.4 UEFI 3.1.1.4 UEFI Most computers today run Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, UEFI. All new computers come with UEFI, which provides additional features and addresses security issues with legacy BIOS. You may see BIOS slash UEFI when booting into your BIOS settings. This is because Intel chips currently support backwards compatibility with legacy BIOS systems. However, by 2020, Intel will end support for legacy BIOS. For more information, do an internet search for Intel to remove legacy BIOS. Note, this section uses BIOS, UEFI, and BIOS slash UEFI interchangeably. In addition, manufacturers may continue to label their UEFI programs with BIOS so that users know it supports the same functions. UEFI configures the same settings as traditional BIOS but also provides additional options. For example, UEFI can provide a mouse-enabled software interface instead of the traditional BIOS screens. However, most systems have a text-based interface similar to legacy BIOS systems. UEFI can run on 32-bit and 64-bit systems, supports larger boot drives, and includes additional features such as secure boot. Secure Boot ensures your computer boots to your specified operating system. This helps prevent rootkits from taking over the system. For more information, do an internet search for Secure Boot and Rootkits. Note, the UEFI setup screens in this section are for reference only and most likely will not look the same as yours. Please consider them as a guide and refer to your motherboard manufacturer documents. Documents Incomplete 3.1.1.5 Check your understanding, BIOS, and UEFI terminology. 3.1.1.5 Check your understanding, BIOS, and UEFI terminology. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the respective term to the definition. A type of memory chip that stores the boot settings. An updated system for booting computers that includes support for 64-bit systems. Performs a hardware check on main computer components to check if they are functioning properly. A legacy system for booting computers. Post.
CMOS UEFI BIOS Submit Incomplete 3.1.1.6 Lab Investigate BIOS or UEFI settings 3.1.1.6 Lab Investigate BIOS or UEFI settings in this lab, you will boot the computer, explore the firmware setup utility program, and change the boot order sequence. Investigate BIOS or UEFI settings. Lab Investigate BIOS or UEFI Settings Introduction In this lab, you will boot the computer, explore the firmware setup utility program, and change the boot order sequence. Recommended Equipment Computer with or without operating system Motherboard Manual Instructions Part 1, Enter BIOS or UEFI Step 1. Power on the computer. Plug the power supply cable into an AC wall outlet. If there is a power switch on the power supply, set the switch to 1. or on. Turn on the computer with the power button on the front panel. Note, if the computer beeps more than once, or if the power does not come on, notify your instructor. Step 2. Enter the firmware setup program. During post, press the firmware setup key or key combination. The firmware setup utility program screen will appear. Questions. What is the key or combination of keys used to enter the firmware setup utility program? Type your answers here. Who manufactures the BIOS or UEFI system for your computer? Type your answers here. What is the BIOS or UEFI version? Type your answers here. Part 2. Explore the settings. Step 1. List the main menu options. Question. List the main menu options and describe what is monitored in each menu. Type your answers here. Lab Investigate BIOS or UEFI settings. Step. Navigate through each screen to find the security settings. Navigate. Step 2. Find the security settings. Navigate through each screen to find the security settings. Question. What security settings and features are available? Type your answers here. Step 3. Find the CPU settings. Navigate through each screen to find the CPU settings. Questions. What is the CPU speed? Type your answers here. What other information is listed for the CPU? Type your answers here. Step 4. Find the RAM settings. Navigate through each screen to find the RAM settings. Questions. What is the RAM speed? Type your answers here. What other information is listed for the RAM? Type your answers here. Step 5. Find the hard drive settings. Navigate through each screen to find the hard drive settings. Questions. What information is listed for the hard drive? Type your answers here. Step 6. Find the boot order sequence. Navigate through each screen to find the boot order sequence. Questions. 
What is the first boot device in the boot order sequence? Type your answers here. How many additional devices can be assigned in the boot order sequence? Type your answers here. Step 7. Set the device boot order settings. Ensure that the first boot order device is the optical drive. Ensure that the second boot order device is the hard disk drive. Lab investigate BIOS or UEFI settings. Questions. Why would you change the first boot device to the optical drive? Type your answers here. What happens when the computer boots and the optical drive does not contain bootable media? Type your answers here. Step 8. Find the power management setup or ACPI screen. Navigate through each screen to find the power management setup screen or ACPI screen. Question. What power management settings are available? Type your answers here. Step 9. Find the PNP settings. Navigate through each screen to find the PNP settings. Question. What PNP settings are available? Type your answers here. Step 10. Find the splash screen settings. Navigate through each screen to find the splash screen settings. Question. What splash screen settings are available? Type your answers here. Step 11. Save and exit the setup utility program. Save the new BIOS slash UEFI settings and exit the setup utility program. The computer should restart automatically. Note, an error message stating that an OS cannot be found or a similar error will appear on the screen after the computer boots. An operating system must now be installed to prevent this error. It is safe to turn off the computer at this time. This lab is complete. Please have the instructor verify your work. End of document. Three dot one dot one dot six lab investigate BIOS or UEFI settings. Three point one point two BIOS slash UEFI configuration. Complete 3.1.2.1 video demonstration, configure BIOS, UEFI settings. 3.1.2.1 video demonstration, configure BIOS, UEFI settings. Select play to view the video. Click here to read the transcript of this video. Hello there, we are back in the UEFI BIOS, and this time we're here to change some settings. In this video we get to configure the UEFI BIOS, and we are going to explore the following items. We will set up our boot options, customize our security settings, take part in some interface configurations, and even use the firmware backup and update tool. So let's begin. We want to configure our boot options. Now you'd think we'd jump straight into motherboard settings and hit boot, but technically we don't even have to go there. On the main UEFI BIOS screen, I can quickly and easily see my boot order listed in this horizontal toolbar. Now this is awesome because if I want my optical drive to be given more preference than something else, I can just click and drag that optical drive to the front of the list. And now it's being given the first boot order preference, such as the optical drive would be booted from before the hard disk drive or USB or anything else. This is great. Now this feature does depend on your motherboard and UEFI firmware, so let's take a look at the official method as well. We'll go into settings, and then I can go ahead and click on boot. And inside of here we'll see this massive list. Now before we just dive into this list, I'd like to take note of the boot mode select. With boot mode select here, I see that the default option is legacy and UEFI. It has been predicted that in the next couple of years, legacy will no longer exist. It is here at this time to allow our board to be backward compatible, with devices that require legacy BIOS settings. If you'd like to, you can select the option and you'd actually be able to click UEFI only, as long as you know your devices will still be supported. Let's continue. 
So down below is my list. My current boot option one is set as my optical drive, the UFI CD DVD. That's from my previous drag and drop maneuver. To modify this list, you can just click on any one of these items, such as, for example, boot option one, and I can choose what device will be booted first. For example, how about my USB key? There we go. And now that's first. You see that horizontal list from left to right has changed up above. We can also go and click on any one of these items and use the plus or minus arrows to move them up or down on the list as well. I personally like the drag and drop option we saw previously. Next, it's time to take a look at some security settings. Back to motherboard settings and then into security. We can find some important settings that we can configure. Here in the security settings, let's take a look at the passwords. The administrator password can be set to prevent other people from accessing and changing your BIO settings. I'll click enter and we're going to make this thing, whew, there's already a password on it. It was Cisco. We're going to make it Cisco again. Create new password, Cisco. Confirm new password, Cisco. And now our administrator password is Cisco. If you want to change and save our BIOS, you're going to need that password of Cisco to do it. Now the user password down below, this is special. This can be set in order to prevent the operating system from loading on your machine until a user has entered the correct user password stored here in BIOS. Further, there's this feature called UKey. The UKey feature allows the BIOS administrator to dedicate a password to a specific USB key or flash drive. The USB key or flash drive will be needed to be plugged into your machine when a user wants to access the operating system of the machine. Wow. Never knew a USB flash drive could be so important. Let's continue on and take a look at some of the interface configuration settings. In the main settings area, we're going to go into advanced. And inside of advanced, we're going to access the integrated peripherals. Within the integrated peripherals, we're going to find a good amount of settings to control. In this section, we have the ability to control the onboard LAN controller. This is our physical network card of the device. We can actually disable it here if we don't want to use it. We take a look at Wi-Fi and Bluetooth controller. We can also control if the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth components are allowed to be used on the computer. Think of this as using software to disable individual hardware components on the physical computer before the operating system even got a chance to use it. This is awesome. We can even make changes to how the SATA hard drives are going to be viewed. For example, I can click enter on SATA mode. We can have these SATA hard drives in the legacy IDE mode, current AHCI mode, or even by utilizing RAID. On top of all that, down below, we can customize that the SATA connections are allowed to be hot swappable as well. Let's back up a little bit and take a look at some USB configuration. In settings, advanced, USB configs, we want to take a look here and see that we can actually control both legacy USB support, as well as disabling or enabling the USB controller itself. With this coming into mind, I want you to imagine this machine being in a high risk or high profile environment, and you have to be the IT professional that is concerned about people bringing in external USB flash drives. Problem identified and problem solved. Let's take a step back. Now what we want to take a look at is our Windows configuration. Right here in the Windows configuration, we can control how quickly our machine will boot. We can do this by activating Fast Boot or by activating MSI Fast Boot. These will allow your systems to come online more quickly by skipping some of the more thorough post verification tests. Next, we want to talk about what makes our machine boot in the morning, and that's our wake up event settings. We can click on this item to control what is allowed to wake up our computer and turn it on. There's a couple here, not too many. We have one last section to cover in this video, and we're going to go all the way back, and we're going to head over to mFlash. mFlash is all about firmware updates for our UFI BIOS. We will have the ability to save our current BIOS to a USB flash drive that's plugged in. This will allow us to restore it at a later date. We also have the ability to update the BIOS using this tool. So for example, I can click Save BIOS to Storage. And there is my disk, which I can click on, leave the default, and it's saving it to my USB flash drive. By using the update BIOS feature, 
we can load a BIOS file that is on a USB flash drive that is plugged into our machine. Now this is going to be awesome because this is your storing and recovery, especially when you have settings that you're concerned about and concerned about losing and not having in the future. We can use the update BIOS feature to actually select a file off of a USB thumb drive. And here, if I had a BIOS ready to go, I can click on the UFI flash thumb drive and be able to update the BIOS itself. Now, while every UFI BIOS will be a little bit different, you should have a much better understanding of how to configure some of the important settings within your UFI BIOS. Complete 3.1.2.2 BIOS and UEFI Security. 3.1.2.2 BIOS and UEFI Security. The legacy BIOS supports some security features to protect the BIOS setting. UEFI adds additional security features. These are some common security features found in the BIOS slash UEFI systems. Passwords. Passwords allow for different levels of access to the BIOS settings. Usually, there are two password settings that can be altered, the supervisor password and the user password. The supervisor password can access all user access passwords and all BIOS screens and settings. The user password gives access to the BIOS based on a defined level. The table below displays common levels of user access to BIOS. The supervisor password must be set before the user password can be configured. Complete 3.1.2.2 Table 0 Access Levels Access Level Level Description Full Access all screens and settings are available, except the supervisor password setting. Limited access. Changes can be made to certain settings only, for example, the time and date. View only access. All screens are available, but no settings can be changed. No access. No access is provided to the BIOS setup utility. Drive encryption. A hard drive can be encrypted to prevent data theft. Encryption changes the data on the drive into code. Without the correct password, the computer cannot boot and data read from the hard drive cannot be understood. Even if the hard drive is placed in another computer, the data remains encrypted. LoJack, this is a security feature that consists of two programs, the persistence module and the application agent. The persistence module is embedded in the BIOS while the application agent is installed by the user. When installed, the persistence module in the BIOS is activated and cannot be turned off. The application agent routinely contacts a monitoring center over the internet to report device information and location. The owner can perform the functions described in the figure below. Trusted Platform Module, TPM, this is a chip designed to secure hardware by storing encryption keys, digital certificates, passwords, and data. TPM is used by Windows to support BitLocker full disk encryption. Encryption 
Secure Boot Secure Boot is a UEFI security standard that ensures that a computer only boots an OS that is trusted by the motherboard manufacturer. Secure Boot prevents an unauthorized OS from loading during startup. Incomplete 3.1.2.3 Update the firmware 3.1.2.3 Update the firmware Motherboard manufacturers may publish updated BIOS versions to provide enhancements to system stability, compatibility, and performance. However, updating the firmware is risky. The release notes, such as those shown in the figure, describe the upgrade to the product, compatibility improvements, and the known bugs that have been addressed. Some newer devices operate properly only with an updated BIOS installed. You can usually find the current version on the main screen of the BIOS slash UEFI interface. Features added Build 0027 Add Power On option into BIOS Power Loss Control Build 0026 None. Build 0025. Add the function CPU swapping. Remove the function fan control. Add the customer's featured Etherboot. Note, reserve two blocks, FFFOO, FFFOFFFH, and FF50000N, fifth in the flash ROM to support the featured Etherboot. The special Opram of NIC82540 should be only placed in the block. FFFOO, FFFOFFFFH. The special Opram of NIC82550 should be only placed in the block. FFF10000H, FFFFFFH. Issues fixed. Build 0027. System hangs at postcode 67 sometimes during Windows asterisk 2000 continuous. Reboot test with new 2.4G slash 533 FSB CPU 80532KEO561M. Upgrade the microcode for D1 and MO stepping CPU. Build 0026. Defect ID 65139XX SR1350 Key Mitsumi Slimline CD ROM fails on with. Certain multi adapter backplane, note two types exist. One works, the other is not recognized. Upgrade the microcode for D1 and MO stepping CPU to support Intel R Xeon TM. 3.2 GHz 2ML3 cache based processors. A D1 stepping CPU. Before updating motherboard firmware, record the manufacturer of the BIOS and the motherboard model. Use this information to identify the exact files to download from the motherboard manufacturer's site. Only update the firmware if there are problems with the system hardware or to add functionality to the system. Early computer BIOS information was contained in ROM chips. To upgrade the BIOS information, the ROM chip had to be physically replaced, which was not always possible. Modern BIOS chips are electronically erasable programmable read-only memory, EEPROM, which can be upgraded by the user without opening the computer case. This process is called flashing the BIOS. To download a new BIOS, consult the manufacturer's website and follow the recommended installation procedures. Installing BIOS software online may involve downloading a new BIOS file, copying or extracting files to removable media, and then booting from the removable media.
An installation program prompts the user for information to complete the process. Many motherboard manufacturers now provide software to flash the BIOS from within an operating system. For example, the Asus Easy Update utility automatically updates a motherboard's software, drivers, and the BIOS version. It also enables a user to manually update a saved BIOS and select a boot logo when the system goes into post. The utility is included with the motherboard, or it can be downloaded from the Asus website. Caution, an improperly installed or aborted BIOS update can cause the computer to become unusable. Incomplete 3.1.2.4 Check your understanding, BIOS, and UEFI configuration terminology. 3.1.2.4 Check your understanding, BIOS, and UEFI configuration terminology. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the term with the respective description. Secure boot. Lojack. Flashing the BIOS. TPM. A UEFI standard that specifies the OS that is trusted by the manufacturer. Updating an EEPROM boot chip without opening the computer. A chip designed to secure hardware by storing encryption keys, digital certificates, passwords, and data. A security feature that reports device information and location to a monitoring center. Submit. Incomplete 3.1.2.5 Lab, search for BIOS or UEFI firmware updates. 3.1.2.5 Lab, search for BIOS or UEFI firmware updates. In this lab, you will identify the current BIOS or UEFI version and then search for BIOS or UEFI update files. Search for BIOS or UEFI firmware updates. Lab Search for BIOS or UEFI Firmware Updates Introduction In this lab, you will identify the current BIOS or UEFI version, and then search for BIOS or UEFI update files. Recommended Equipment Classroom Computer with an Operating System Installed Internet Access Instructions Step 1. Boot Your Computer during post, BIOS information is displayed on the screen for a short period of time. Do not log on to Windows. Question. What key or combination of keys is used to run setup on your computer? Type your answers here. Step 2. Restart your computer and enter setup. The BIOS setup utility or UEFI screen appears. Questions. Who is the manufacturer of the BIOS? Type your answers here. Which BIOS version is installed in your computer? Type your answers here. 2015 to 2019 Cisco. Page 1 of 2. Lab search for BIOS or UEFI firmware updates. Step 3. Search the internet to find the most current version of BIOS for the motherboard. Caution, do not update your BIOS at this time. Questions What is the current BIOS version available for the motherboard? Type your answers here. What features, if any, have been added to the new BIOS version? Type your answers here. What changes, if any, have been made to the new BIOS version to fix problems? Type your answers here. What are the instructions to update the new BIOS version? Type your answers here. End of document.
2015-2019 to Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco Public Page 2 of 2 www.netacad.com Use the information from the previous step to search the internet to find the most current version of the BIOS for the motherboard in your computer. The following screen is an example of the type of information you would look for to answer the questions below. Updates Incomplete 3.1.2.6 Lab Install Windows 3.1.2.6 Lab Install Windows In this lab, you will perform a basic installation of Windows. Install Windows Lab Install Windows Objectives In this lab, you will install Windows 10. Background slash scenario In order to complete many of the remaining labs in this course, you will need to use Windows. This lab provides a basic installation in order to get Windows up and running on the lab PC. Required Resources A computer with a blank hard disk drive Windows 10 Instruction Step 1, Starting the Installation Media Insert the Windows 10 installation DVD into the DVD-ROM drive or plug the USB flash drive into a USB port. When the computer starts up, watch for the message, press any key to boot from CD or DVD. If the message appears, press any key on the keyboard to boot the computer from the DVD. If the press any key message does not appear, the computer automatically starts loading files from the DVD. The computer starts loading files from the DVD or USB flash drive. Step 2. Configuring initial settings. The window setup window opens. Click next to continue unless you need to change the default settings. Click install now to continue the installation. Step 3. Collecting information. In the enter the product key, to activate Windows window, enter the product key. Note, you can find the product key on the case or sleeve in which the Windows DVD was packaged, or you can get it from your instructor. In the license terms window, read and confirm that you accept the license by selecting the box I accept the license terms. Click next. In the which type of installation do you want? Window, click Custom, Install Windows Only, Advanced. In the Where do you want to install Windows? Window, select the hard drive or partition on which Windows will be installed. In this example, click to select Disk 0 Unallocated Space. Click Next to continue. Setup has finished collecting information for the installation. Lab in Step 4. Installing Windows The Installing Windows window opens. Windows will take some time to copy the files and install the OS on your computer. During the setup, the computer will restart several times. When the Windows needs to restart to continue window opens, your computer will automatically restart or you can click Restart Now. If you get the message, press any key to boot from CD or DVD. Do not press any key and Windows will boot from the hard disk to continue the installation. Step 5. Basic Setup In this step, you will select your region and your keyboard layer. Note, the personalization sub-steps may be different depending on your Windows version. A. Verify the region and select Yes. If not, choose your region and select Yes. Verify the keyboard layout and select Yes. If not, choose your keyboard layout and select Yes. 
Click skip if you are not adding a second keyboard layout. Otherwise, click add layout and answer the prompts to add a second layout. Step 6. Network setup. In this step, the installation may continue without your input. If prompted, provide the installation with the necessary information. Select setup for personal use. Click next to continue. Your instructor may ask you to choose to select setup for an organization. Step 7. Account setup. In this step, you will set up a local account to access the computer. You will not be creating a Microsoft account for this exercise. If you already have an account or choose to do so, you may use your Microsoft account for this step. Note, the account setup sub-steps may be different depending on your Windows version. Click offline account to create a local account. If you already have a Microsoft account and choose to use it, enter the required information and click next to continue. Click no to continue using a local account instead of Microsoft account. Enter a username and click next to continue. Create a password and confirm the password when prompted. Click next to continue. Answer all the security questions and click next to continue. Step 8. Services setup. In this step, you can give permission to use Cortana and select your privacy settings. You can choose to use Cortana as your personal assistant. Click yes or no to continue. Read the privacy settings and click learn more to find out more details. Then decide which features to use and click Accept to continue. Step 9. Finishing the installation. When you are finished with the installation, Windows continues to finalize your settings. Lab Install Windows. After the installation is completed, the desktop displays and you are logged into Windows for the first time. End of document. Three dot one dot two dot six lab install windows incomplete three dot one dot two dot seven lab install third party software in windows three dot one dot two dot seven lab install third party software in windows in this lab you will install third party software. Install third-party software in Windows. Lab install third-party software in Windows. Introduction in this lab, you will install and remove a third-party software application supplied by your instructor. You will install the Packet Tracer Windows application. Recommended Equipment The following equipment is required for this exercise. A computer with Windows installed. A flash drive or CD with the latest Packet Tracer Windows install package. Instructions Part 1. Installing third-party software. Step 1. Locate the installer. Log on to the computer with the administrator account and use File Explorer to navigate to the folder where the Packet Tracer installer is located. This folder could be on the local hard drive, on an external flash drive, or on a CD. Unzip the file as necessary. Locate the Packet Tracer application. The file name is in a form similar to packetracer underscore underscore windows underscore hashtag hashtag bit dot exe where is version number and hashtag hashtag is either 32 or 64. Step 2. Run the installer to install packet tracer. Start the installation process of the packet tracer application. When prompted, click yes to allow this app to make changes to your device. The license agreement window opens. Select I accept the agreement, and then click next. The select destination location window opens. Keep the default settings, and click next. Question. 
What is the default installation location for Packet Tracer? Type your answers here. The Select Start Menu folder window opens. Keep the default settings. Click Next. The Select Additional Tasks window opens. Keep the default settings. Click Next. The Ready to Install window opens. Click Install. The Installing Progress window opens to show the progress of the installation. In the Completing the Cisco Packet Tracer Wizard window, click Finish. Be ready to provide your NITACAD.com credentials when Packet Tracer opens for the first time. When Packet Tracer opens, provide your Networking Academy or Skills for all user credentials to continue. Copyright 2015 to 2022 Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco Public Pay Lab install third-party software in Windows. Part 2 Uninstalling third-party software. To uninstall a program, click Control Panel Programs and Features. Choose Cisco Packet Tracer in the list and right-click Uninstall. The Cisco Packet Tracer uninstall window opens. Click Yes to confirm the removal. When the successfully removed from your computer message opens, click OK. Verify the application was removed. After the application removal process, the Programs and Features window no longer shows Cisco Packet Tracer in the list. Close all open windows. Future activities in this course will require the use of Packet Tracer. Reinstall Packet Tracer. Reflection Question Why does Microsoft recommend using Uninstall or Change a Program to remove an installed application? Type your answers here. End of document. Three point two electrical power. Scroll to begin. Incomplete three point two point one wattage and voltage. Complete three dot two dot one dot one wattage and voltage. Three dot two dot one dot one wattage and voltage. Power supply specifications are typically expressed in watts W. To understand what a watt is, refer to the interactive image which describes the four basic units of electricity that a computer technician must know. A basic equation, known as Ohm's law, expresses how voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance, V equals IR. In an electrical system, power is equal to the voltage multiplied by the current P equals 6. A tabbed content container. Content can be text, graphic, or both. Click each tab to learn more about the relationship between wattage and voltage. Measured in volts, V. This is a measure of work required to move a charge from one location to another. A computer power supply usually produces several different voltages. Voltage, V. Resistance, R. Current, I. Power, P. Complete through. A good. Measured in ohms, omega. This refers to the opposition to the flow of current in a circuit. Lower resistance allows more current to flow through a circuit. A good fuse has low resistance or almost zero ohms. Voltage Measured in amperes, or amps, A. This is a measure of the amount of electrons moving through a circuit per second. Computer power supplies deliver different amperages for each output voltage. Measured in watts, W. 
This is a measure of the work required to move electrons through a circuit voltage multiplied by the number of electrons going through that circuit per second current. Computer power supplies are rated in watts. On the back of some power supplies is a small switch called the voltage selector switch. 3.2.1.2 Power Supply Voltage Setting Or Supply Voltage Setting On the back of some power supplies is a small switch called the Voltage Selector Switch, as shown in the image. This switch sets the input voltage to the power supply to either 110V slash 115V or 220V slash 230V. A power supply with this switch is called a dual voltage power supply. The correct voltage setting is determined by the country where the power supply is used. Setting the voltage switch to the incorrect input voltage could damage the power supply and other parts of your computer. If a power supply does not have this switch, it automatically detects and sets the correct voltage. Caution, do not open a power supply. Electronic capacitors located inside of a power supply can hold a charge for extended periods of time. For more information about power supplies, click here. ITS 3.2.1.3 Lab Ohm's Law In this lab, you will answer questions based on electricity and Ohm's Law.
3.2.2 Power Fluctuation and Protection Incomplete 3.2.2.1 Power Fluctuation Types 3.2.2.1 Power Fluctuation Types Voltage is a measure of energy required to move a charge from one location to another. The movement of electrons is called current. Computer circuits need voltage and current to operate electronic components. When the voltage in a computer is not accurate or steady, computer components might not operate correctly. Unsteady voltages are called power fluctuations. The following types of AC power fluctuations can cause data loss or hardware failure. Blackout, complete loss of AC power. A blown fuse, damaged transformer, or downed power line can cause a blackout. Brownout, reduced voltage level of AC power that lasts for a period of time. Brownouts occur when the power line voltage drops below 80% of the normal voltage level and when electrical circuits are overloaded. Noise, interference from generators and lightning. Noise results in poor quality power, which can cause errors in a computer system. Spike, sudden increase in voltage that lasts for a short period and exceeds 100% of the normal voltage on a line. Spikes can be caused by lightning strikes, but can also occur when the electrical system comes back on after a blackout. Power surge, dramatic increase in voltage above the normal flow of electrical current. A power surge lasts for a few nanoseconds, or one billionth of a second. Second. Complete 3.2.2.2 Power Protection Devices 3.2.2.2 Power Protection Devices To help shield against power fluctuation problems, use devices to protect the data and computer equipment. Surge Protector helps protect against damage from surges and spikes. A surge suppressor diverts extra electrical voltage that is on the line to the ground. The amount of protection offered by a surge protector is measured in joules. The higher the joule rating, the more energy over time the surge protector can absorb. Once the number of joules is reached, the surge protector no longer provides protection and will need to be replaced. Uninterruptible Power Supply, UPS, helps protect against potential electrical power problems by supplying a consistent level of electrical power to a computer or other device. The battery is constantly recharging while the UPS is in use. The UPS provides a consistent quality of power when brownouts and blackouts occur. Many UPS devices can communicate directly with the computer operating system. This communication allows the UPS to safely shut down the computer and save data prior to the UPS losing all battery power. Standby Power Supply, SPS, helps protect against potential electrical power problems by providing a backup battery to supply power when the incoming voltage drops below the normal level. The battery is on standby during normal operation. When the voltage decreases, the battery provides DC power to a power inverter, which converts it to AC power for the computer. This device is not as reliable as a UPS because of the time it takes to switch over to the battery. If the switching device fails, the battery cannot supply power to the computer. Caution, UPS manufacturers suggest never plugging a laser printer into a UPS because the printer could overload the UPS. UPS 
Incomplete 3.2.2.3 Check your understanding. Power fluctuation turns. 3.2.2.3 Check your understanding. Power fluctuation turns. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the term with the respective description. Uninterrupted Power Supply, UPS. Power Surge. Noise. Spike. Standby Power Supply, STP. Dramatic increase in voltage above the normal flow of electrical current. Supplies a consistent level of electrical power to a computer or other device. Interference from generators and lightning. Provides a backup battery to supply power when the incoming voltage drops below the normal. Sudden increase in voltage exceeding 100% of the normal voltage on a line. 3.2.2.3 Check your understanding. Power fluctuation turns. Match the options as described in the table. Noise. Interference from generators and lightning. Three point three advanced computer functionality. Scroll to begin. Incomplete three point three point one CPU architectures and operation. Incomplete three dot three dot one dot one CPU architectures. Three dot three dot one dot one CPU architectures. A program is a sequence of stored instructions. A CPU executes these instructions by following a specific instruction set. There are two distinct types of instruction sets that CPUs may use. Reduced Instruction Set Computer, RISC, this architecture uses a relatively small set of instructions. RISC chips are designed to execute these instructions very rapidly. Some well-known CPUs using RISC are PowerPC and ARM. Complex Instruction Set Computer, CISC, this architecture uses a broad set of instructions, resulting in fewer steps per operation. Intel x86 and Motorola 68K are some well-known CPUs using CISC. While the CPU is executing one step of the program, the remaining instructions and the data are stored nearby in a special, high-speed memory called cache. Incomplete 3.3.1.2 Enhancing CPU Operation 3.3.1.2 Enhancing CPU Operation Various CPU manufacturers complement their CPU with performance-enhancing features. For instance, Intel incorporates hyperthreading to enhance the performance of some of their CPUs. With hyperthreading, multiple pieces of code, threads, are executed simultaneously in the CPU. To an operating system, a single CPU with hyperthreading performs as though there are two CPUs when multiple threads are being processed. AMD processors use hypertransport to enhance CPU performance. Hypertransport is a high-speed connection between the CPU and the Northbridge chip. The power of a CPU is measured by the speed and the amount of data that it can process. The speed of a CPU is rated in cycles per second, such as millions of cycles per second, called megahertz, megahertz, or billions of cycles per second, called gigahertz, gigahertz. The amount of data that a CPU can process at one time depends on the size of the front side bus, FSB. This is also called the CPU bus or the processor data bus. 
Higher performance can be achieved when the width of the FSB increases, much like a roadway can carry more cars when it has many lanes. The width of the FSB is measured in bits. A bit is the smallest unit of data in a computer. Current processors use a 32-bit or 64-bit FSB. Overclocking is a technique used to make a processor work at a faster speed than its original specification. Overclocking is not a recommended way to improve computer performance and can result in damage to the CPU. The opposite of overclocking is CPU throttling. CPU throttling is a technique used when the processor runs at less than the rated speed to conserve power or produce less heat. Throttling is commonly used on laptops and other mobile devices. CPU virtualization is a hardware feature supported by AMD and Intel CPUs that enables a single processor to act as multiple processors. This hardware virtualization technology allows the operating system to support virtualization more effectively and efficiently than is possible through software emulation. With CPU virtualization, multiple operating systems can run in parallel on their own virtual machines as if they were running on completely independent computers. CPU virtualization is sometimes disabled by default in the BIOS and will need to be enabled. Incomplete 3.3.1.3 Multicore Processors 3.3.1.3 Multicore Processors The latest processor technology has resulted in CPU manufacturers finding ways to incorporate more than one CPU core into a single chip. Multicore processors have two or more processors on the same integrated circuit. In some architectures, the cores have separate L2 and L3 cache resources, while in other architectures cache is shared among the different cores for better performance and resource allocation. The table in the figure describes the various types of multi-core processors. Integrating the processors on the same chip creates a very fast connection between them. Multi-core processors execute instructions more quickly than single-core processors. Instructions can be distributed to all the processors at the same time. RAM is shared between the processors because the cores reside on the same chip. A multi-core processor is recommended for applications such as video editing, gaming, and photo manipulation. High power consumption creates more heat in the computer case. Multi-core processors conserve power and produce less heat than multiple single-core processors, thus increasing performance and efficiency. Another feature found in some CPUs is an integrated graphics processing unit or GPU. The GPU is a chip that performs the rapid mathematical calculations required to render graphics. A GPU can be integrated or dedicated. Integrated GPUs are often directly embedded on the CPU and is dependent on system RAM while the dedicated GPU is a separate chip with its own video memory dedicated exclusively for graphical processing. The benefit of integrated GPUs is cost and less heat dissipation. This allows for cheaper computers and smaller form factors. The trade-off is performance. Integrated GPUs are good at less complex tasks like watching videos and processing graphical documents, but are not best suited for intense gaming applications. CPUs have also been enhanced using the NX bit, also called the Execute Disable bit. This feature, when supported and enabled in the operating system, can protect areas of memory that contain operating system files from malicious attacks by malware. Number of cores Description Single core CPU One core inside a single CPU that handles all the processing. 
A motherboard may have sockets for more than one single processor, providing the ability to build a powerful, multiprocessor computer. Dual Core CPU Two cores inside a single CPU in which both cores can process information at the same time. Triple Core CPU Three cores inside a single CPU this is a quad-core processor with one of the cores disabled. Quad-core CPU Four cores inside a single CPU. Hexa-core CPU Six cores inside a single CPU. Octa-core CPU Eight cores inside a single CPU. Incomplete 3.3.1.4 CPU Cooling Mechanisms 3.3.1.4 CPU Cooling Mechanisms Slideshow Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows below for more information on different mechanisms for cooling a computer. Case Fan Increasing the airflow in the computer case allows more heat to be removed. An active cooling solution uses fans inside of a computer case to blow out hot air. For increased airflow, some cases have multiple fans with cool air being brought in while another fan is blowing out hot air. Incomplete 3.3.1.5 Check your understanding, CPU architectures and operation. 3.3.1.5 Check your understanding, CPU architectures and operation. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the term with the respective description. CPU virtualization Hyperthreading Overclocking Water cooling system. Throttling. Hypertransport. This is a technique used when the processor runs at less than the rated speed to conserve power or produce less heat. Is used by a very fast CPU that produces more heat than can be dispelled. This is a hardware feature supported by AMD and Intel CPUs that enables a single processor to act as multiple processors. This is a technique used to make a processor work at a faster speed than its original specification. This comprises of multiple pieces of code are executed simultaneously in the CPU. This is a high-speed connection between the CPU and the Northbridge chip. Submit. Show feedback. Incomplete Incomplete 3.3.3.3.2 RAID Incomplete 3.3.2.1 What do you already know? RAID 3.3.2.1 What do you already know? RAID Matching Select from lists and then submit what do you already know? Is a type of activity in which we ask you to simply take a guess. It is not meant to evaluate your knowledge. 
You will receive additional information for the answers that you choose, so these activities also help you learn. For each scenario, select the best characteristic of RAID that is described. A user is concerned that the failure of a HDD will cause the loss of important data. Please select an option. Economy. A manager wants to be sure that A user is concerned that the failure of a HDD will cause the loss of important data. Availability. A manager wants to be sure that employees can access the data that they need when they need it. Please select an option. HDD data transfer. A manager wants to be sure that. A. Reliability. A manager wants to be sure that employees can access the data that they need when they need it. Availability. HDD data transfer rates have been a small bit been identified as the cause of work delays. Performance. A small business has recently grown and is running out of data storage space. Capacity. A company is shopping for larger HDDs and finds them to be too expensive. Corrupted data has been causing problems with applications. Expensive. Economy. Corrupted data has been causing problems with applications. Please select an option. Economy. Redundant. Submit. Show feedback. Incomplete Storage devices can be grouped cations. Redundancy. Incomplete 3.3.2. Correct. A user is concerned that the failure of a HDD will cause the loss of important data. This best choice is redundancy. This involves having backup resources that can rapidly replace failed devices and lost data or connectivity. 
A manager wants to be sure that employees can access the data that they need when they need it. The best choice is availability. These are IT resources that can be accessed by those who need them at all times. HDD data transfer rates have been identified as the cause of work delays. The best choice is performance. This is the rate at which tasks can be performed. For storage devices, it is usually the read and write rates in MB s A small business has recently grown and is running out of data storage space. The best choice is capacity. This is the amount of data that can be stored. A company is shopping for larger HDDs and finds them to be too expensive. The best choice is economy. This is the relative cost of a solution based on its benefit. Economical things cost less than other things for the capabilities that they offer. Corrupted data has been causing problems with applications. The best choice is reliability. This is when devices function as intended for a predictable amount of time. Close pop-up. Three dot three dot two dot two RAID concepts. Storage devices can be grouped and managed to create large storage volumes with redundancy. To do so, computers can implement redundant array of independent disks (RAID) technology. RAID provides a way to store data across multiple storage devices for availability, reliability, capacity, and redundancy, and/or performance improvement. In addition, it may be more economical to create an array of smaller devices than it is to purchase a single device of the combined capacity provided by the RAID, especially for very large drives. To the operating system, a RAID array appears as one drive. The following terms describe how RAID stores data on the various disks. Striping. This RAID type enables data to be distributed across multiple drives. This provides a significant performance increase. However, since the data is distributed across multiple drives, the failure of a single drive means that all data is lost. Mirroring: This RAID type stores duplicate data on one or more other drives. This provides redundancy so that the failure of a drive does not cause the loss of data. The mirror can be recreated by replacing the drive and restoring the data from the good drive. Parity: This RAID type provides basic error checking and fault tolerance by storing checksums separately from data. This enables the reconstruction of lost data without sacrificing speed and capacity, like mirroring. Double parity. This RAID type provides fault tolerance up to two failed drives. The figure shows a large drive enclosure that could be used in a data center with one or more RAID implementations. Drive enclosures can use hot swappable drives. This means that a drive that fails can be replaced without powering down the entire RAID. Powering down the RAID may make the data on the RAID unavailable to users for an extended period of time. Not all drives and RAID types support hot swapping. Incomplete 3.3.2.3 RAID Levels 3.3.2.3 RAID Levels There are several levels of RAID available. These levels use mirroring, striping, and parity in different ways. Higher levels of RAID, such as RAID 5 or 6, use striping and parity in combination to provide speed and to create large volumes. The figure shows the details about the RAID levels. 
Raid levels higher than 10 combine lower raid levels. For example, Raid 10 combines Raid 1 and Raid 0 functionalities. Raid level Minimum number of drives Features Advantages Disadvantages Zero Two Striping Performance and capacity All data is lost if one drive fails One Two Mirroring Performance and reliability. Capacity is half of total drive size. 5. 3. Striping with parity. Performance, reliability, and capacity. It takes time to rebuild array if a drive fails. 6. 4. Striping with double parity. Same as RAID 5, but can tolerate the loss of two drives. It takes time to rebuild array if one or more drives fails. 10, 0 plus 1. 4. Mirroring and striping. Performance, capacity, and high reliability. Capacity is half of total drive size. Incomplete 3.3.2.4 Check your understanding, RAID levels. 3.3.2.4 Check your understanding, RAID levels. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the RAID level with the respective features. 1. 5 0 Submit Show feedback Features 1 5 0 6 Striping Parody Double parody Mirroring Submit Incomplete 3.3.3 ports, connectors, and cables. Incomplete 3.3.3.1 legacy ports. 3.3.3.1 legacy ports. Slideshow. Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows for more information about different legacy ports. Legacy Ports Computers have many different types of ports to connect the computer to external peripheral devices. As computer technology has evolved, so have the types of ports used to connect peripheral devices. Legacy ports are typically found on older computers and have been mostly replaced by newer technologies such as USB. Select the arrows above for more information about different legacy ports. Serial Serial ports were used to connect various peripherals such as printers, scanners, and modems. Today, serial ports are sometimes used for making console connections to network devices to perform initial configuration. There are two form factors of serial ports, a 9-pin DB9 port and a 25-pin port. Parallel Parallel ports have a 25-pin receptacle used to connect various peripheral devices. As the name implies, parallel ports send data in multiple bits at once in parallel communication. Because these ports were often used to connect printers, they are often called printer ports. Game The 15-pin game port was used as a connector for joystick input. 
Game ports were originally located on a dedicated game controller expansion card and then later integrated with sound cards and on PC motherboards. Incomplete 3.3.3 3.3.3. Motherboards. PS slash 2. The PS slash 2 is a 6-pin DIN connector used for connecting a keyboard and mouse. Shown are two color-coded PS slash 2, purple for the keyboard and green for the mouse. Audio ports. Audio ports connect audio devices to the computer. Analog ports typically include a line-in port to connect to an external source, e.g. stereo system, a microphone port, and line-out ports to connect speakers or headphones. Incomplete 3.3.3.2 Video and Graphic Ports 3.3.3.2 Video and Graphic Ports Slideshow Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows for more information about video and graphic ports. Video and graphic ports. Graphic ports are used to connect monitors and external video displays to desktop computers and laptops. Select the arrows above for more information about video and graphic ports. VGA. VGA is an analog port and is the oldest graphics port likely still used on some PCs, although it is quickly becoming a legacy technology. VGA ports are colored blue and accept a 15-pin connector, with the pins arranged in three rows. DVI the emergence of digital displays such as LCD monitors and TVs led to the development of the DVI for transmitting uncompressed digital video. Variants of the DVI interface are configured to support multiple transmission modes. DVI, analog, supports analog only, DVI-D, digital, supports digital only, and DVI-I, integrated, supports both digital and analog. There are also two forms of DVI connections, single link connections that use a single transition minimized differential signaling, TMDS, transmitter, and dual link connections that use two TMDS transmitters to provide higher resolutions to larger monitors. HDMI HDMI carries the same video information as DVI but is also capable of providing digital audio and control signals. HDMI uses a 19-pin connector. Smaller portable electronic devices have a smaller 19-pin mini HDMI port. HDMI is capable of very high resolutions. HDMI is also capable of changing the refresh rate of a monitor to match the rate of the source device output. There are two categories of HDMI, one, standard, and two, high speed. There are also many versions of the HDMI standard such as version 1.4. Newer versions of the standard support the latest features such as high refresh rates and 4K and 8K resolutions. Versions 2.0 and 2.1 can achieve very high speeds. 2.0 supports premium high speed up to 18 gigabits per second and 2.1 supports ultra high speed up to 48 gigabits per second. A high-speed HDMI cable that supports at least HDMI 1.4 is required for supporting 4K signals. HDMI connectors are available in three sizes, standard, mini, and micro. The majority of HDMI connectors in use today are the Type A, standard, Type C, mini, and Type D, micro. Display Port the DisplayPort is a newer technology designed to replace both DVI and VGA for connecting computer monitors. 
The DisplayPort uses a 20-pin connector for delivering high bandwidth video and audio signals. Like HDMI, there is a miniaturized version of the DisplayPort called the Mini DisplayPort, which is primarily used on Apple computers. DisplayPort can handle up to 20 gigabits per second with version 2.0. DisplayPort is also capable of connecting multiple monitors to the same video source with a single cable. Incomplete 3.3.3.3 USB cables and connectors 3.3.3.3 USB cables and connectors Slideshow Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows for more information on USB cables and connectors. USB cables and connectors Over the years, the USB protocol has evolved and the various standards can be confusing. USB 1.0 provided a low speed transfer rate at 1.5 megabits per second for keyboards and mice and a full speed channel at 12 megabits per second. USB 2.0 made a significant leap, increasing transfer rates up to high speed at 480 megabits per second. USB 3.0 increased the transfer rate to super speed 5 gigabits per second. USB 3.1 increased the transfer rate of super speed to 10 gigabits per second, and USB 3.2, the latest USB-C specification, supports speeds of up to super speed plus 20 gigabits per second. USB Type-A This is a rectangular connector found on virtually every desktop PC and laptop, as well as TVs, game consoles, and media players. USB 1.1, 2.0, and 3.0 Type-A connectors and receptacles are physically compatible. Mini USB The USB Mini B connector is rectangular with a small indention on each side. The mini USB form factor is being phased out and replaced by the micro USB connector. Micro USB The micro USB connector is found on smartphones, tablets, and other devices. Except for Apple, most manufacturers have adopted the micro USB interface. The USB 2.0 micro B connector has two corners pushed in at an angle. USB Type-B The USB Type-B connector is commonly used to connect printer and external hard drives. It has a square shape with beveled exterior corners and an extra notch at the top. Incomplete 3.3.3.4 SATA cables and connectors USB Type-C the USB Type-C connector is the newest USB interface. It is smaller than the Type-A connector and is rectangular with four rounded corners. Both Thunderbolt 3 and USB Type-C are an example of a multipurpose cable that can be used to attach different kinds of peripheral devices to a PC. USB Type-C is the shape of the port. Thunderbolt 3 combines the functionality of USB, Thunderbolt, DisplayPort, and the ability to deliver power to devices through the cable. Lightning The Lightning connector is a small proprietary 8-pin connector used by Apple mobile devices such as iPhones, iPads, and iPods for both power charging and data transfer. It is similar in appearance to a USB Type-C connector. Incomplete 3.3.3.4 SATA cables and connectors 3.3.3.4 SATA cables and connectors Slideshow Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows for more information about SATA cables and connectors. SATA cables and connectors 
SATA is an interface type used to connect SATA hard drives and other storage devices to the motherboard inside the computer. SATA cables are long, up to 1 meter, and thin with a flat and thin 7-pin connector on each end. SATA cable and connector One end plugs into a SATA port on the motherboard and the other end into the back of an internal storage device such as a SATA hard drive. The SATA connector has an L-shaped key so that it can only be installed in one way. SATA data and power cables The SATA cable does not provide power so an addition cable is needed to supply power to SATA drives. eSATA cable eSATA is used to connect external SATA drives. eSATA connectors do not have an L-shaped key like the SATA connector. However, an eSATA port does have a key feature to prevent inadvertent insertion of a USB connector, which is similar in size and shape. eSATA Adapter Card Often, an expansion card is installed in the computer to provide eSATA ports. Incomplete 3.3.3.5 Twisted Pair Cables and Connectors 3.3.3.5 Twisted Pair Cables and Connectors Slideshow Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows for more information about Twisted Pair Cables and Connectors. Twisted Pair Cables and Connectors Twisted Pair Cable is used in wired Ethernet networks and in older telephone networks. Twisted pair cabling gets its name from the fact that pairs of wires inside the cable are twisted together. The twisting of wire pairs helps reduce crosstalk and electromagnetic induction. RJ45 Connector Each end of a UTP cable must be terminated with a connector. In the case of Ethernet networks, it is an RJ45 connector that terminates the cable and is plugged into an Ethernet port. Twisted Pairs There are basically two types of twisted pair cables, unshielded twisted pair, UTP, cabling and shielded twisted pair, STP. The most commonly used form of twisted pair cabling is UTP. It consists of color-coded insulated copper wires without the foil or braiding found in STP. RJ11 Connector Older telephone networks used a 4-wire UTP cable with two wire pairs terminated with a 6-pin RJ11 connector. The RJ11 connector looks very similar to the RJ45 connector but is smaller. Incomplete 3.3.3.6 Coax Cables and Connectors 3.3.3.6 Coax Cables and Connectors Slideshow Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows for more information about Coax Cables and Connectors. Coax Cables and Connectors Coaxial cable has an inner center conductor, usually made from copper or copper-clad steel, which is surrounded by a non-conductive dielectric insulating material. The dielectric is surrounded by a foil shield which forms the outer conductor and shields against electromagnetic interference, EMI. The outer conductor slash shield is encased in a PVC outer jacket. Coax cable construction Coax cable with the outer jacket pulled back to reveal the braided shielding and copper core conductor. RG6 RG6 cable is heavy gauge and has insulation and shielding tuned for high bandwidth, high frequency applications such as internet, cable TV, and satellite TV signals. RG6 commonly uses an F-type connector as shown in the figure. RG-59 
RG59 cable is thinner than RG6 and has less shielding. RG59 is recommended in low bandwidth and lower frequency applications such as analog video and CCTV applications. RG59 commonly uses a BNC connector as shown in the next figure. BNC BNC connectors connect coaxial cables to devices using a quarter-turn connection scheme. BNC is used with digital or analog audio or video. Incomplete 3.3.3.7 SCSI and IDE cables and connectors. 3.3.3.7 SCSI and IDE cables and connectors. Slideshow. Select the next button to progress. Select the arrows for more information about SCSI and IDE cable and connectors. SCSI cables and connectors. Small Computer Systems Interface, SCSI, is a standard for connecting peripheral and storage devices. SCSI is a bus technology, meaning that all devices connect to a central bus and are daisy-chained together. The cabling slash connector requirements depend upon the location of the SCSI bus. Integrated Drive Electronics, IDE, is a standard type of interface used to connect some hard drives and optical drives to each other and to the motherboard. External SCSI Cable the Centronics connector is used for connecting older external SCSI devices such as scanners and printers. This connector came in 36-pin and 50-pin versions. The pins are arranged in two rows with a plastic bar through the center that holds the contact pins. Squeeze latches or bail locks located on the sides of the connector are used to hold it in place. Internal SCSI Cable a common SCSI connector for internal hard drives is the internal 50-pin SCSI which has 50 pins arranged in two rows and is attached to a ribbon cable. IDE Cable IDE ribbon cables look very similar to internal SCSI cables however IDE uses 40-pin connectors. There are typically three connectors on the cable. One to connect to the IDE port on the motherboard and two for attachment of IDE drives. Incomplete 3.3.3.8 Check your understanding. Identify the external connectors. 3.3.3.8 Check your understanding. Identify the external connectors. This is a multiple choice question. Once you have selected an option, select the Submit button button below. Identify the three external connections of a computer. Choose three. Submit. USB ports provide external connections for the keyboard, mouse, and portable storage device. DVI is an external video connection from the graphics card to the screen. The Ethernet network port provides external access to a network. The internal computer connections are SATA, IDE, and the drive activity LED. Close pop-up. 3.3.4 Monitors Incomplete 3.3.4.1 Monitor Characteristics 3.3.4.1 Monitor Characteristics 
There are many types of computer monitors available. Some are designed for casual use, while others are for specific requirements, such as those used by architects, graphic designers, or even gamers. Monitors vary by use, size, quality, clarity, brightness, and more. Therefore, it is useful to understand the various terms used when discussing monitors. Computer monitors are usually described by Screen size, this is the diagonal measurement of the screen, i.e., top left to bottom right, in inches. Common sizes include 19 to 24 inches to ultra-wide monitors that are 30 or more inches wide. Larger monitors are usually better but are more expensive and require more desk space. Resolution, resolution is measured by the number of horizontal and vertical pixels. For example, 1920 by 1080, i.e. 1080p, is a common resolution. This means it has 1920 horizontal pixels and 1080 vertical pixels. Monitor resolution, this relates to the amount of information that can be displayed on a screen. A higher resolution monitor displays more information on a screen than a lower resolution monitor does. This is true even with monitors that have the same screen size. Native resolution, this identifies the best monitor resolution for the specific monitor. In Windows 10, the native resolution of a monitor is identified using the keyword recommended beside the monitor resolution. For example, in the figure, the native resolution of the monitor is 1920 times 1080. Native mode, this term describes when the image sent to the monitor by the video adapter card matches the native resolution of the monitor. Connectivity, older monitors use VGA or DVI connectors while newer monitors support HDMI and DisplayPort ports. DisplayPort is a connection found on newer monitors. It supports higher resolutions and high refresh rates. Note, if you want to display more things on the screen, then select a higher resolution monitor. If you just want things to appear bigger, then select a larger screen size. Incomplete 3.3.4.2 monitor terms. 3.3.4.2 Monitor Terms List of expandable sections Select each button to expand the content Click each term to read a brief description Pixel Abbreviation for Picture Element and is a tiny dot capable of displaying the shades red, green, and blue, RGB more pixels mean the monitor can display more detail. Dot pitch. This is the distance between pixels on the screen. A lower dot pitch, i.e., a smaller distance between dots, produces a better image. Brightness. Describes the luminance of a monitor measured in candelas per square meter, CD slash M2. Brightness up to 250 candelas per square meter is typically recommended. However, in well-lit rooms, use up to 350 candelas per square meter. Note, too much brightness may cause eye strain. Contrast ratio. This is a measurement of how white and how black a monitor can get. A contrast ratio of 1, 0, 0, 0 to 1 displays dimmer whites and more pale blacks than 4, 500 to 1. Aspect ratio Aspect ratio is the horizontal to vertical measurement of the viewing area of a monitor. For example, QSXGA measures 2,560 pixels horizontally by 2,048 pixels vertically, which creates an aspect ratio of 5 to 4. 
If a viewing area was 16 inches wide by 12 inches high, then the aspect ratio would be 4 to 3. A viewing area that is 24 inches wide by 18 inches high also has an aspect ratio of 4 to 3. Refresh rate Expressed in Hertz HC and refers to how often per second your monitor can redraw the screen. Response time the amount in time for a pixel to change properties, i.e., color or brightness. Fast response times display a smooth image when displaying fast action. Frames per second, FPS. FPS is, is how many times the computer is creating each frame. The higher the FPS, the better, but the monitor must be able to display the frames at the high rate. Interlaced slash non-interlaced. Interlaced monitors create the image by scanning the screen two times. The first scan covers the odd lines, top to bottom, and the second scan covers the even lines. Non-interlaced monitors create the image by scanning the screen one line at a time from top to bottom. Incomplete 3.3.4.3 Display Standards 3.3.4.3 Display Standards List of expandable sections Select each button to expand the content. Over the years, there have been many different display standards developed. Click each standard to see its resolution, aspect ratio, and a brief description. CGA Resolution Aspect Ratio Comment 320 by 200 1610 Color Graphics Adapter Introduced by IBM in 1981 Obsolete VGA Resolution Aspect Ratio Comment 640 by 480 4 colon 3 Video Graphics Array Introduced in 1987 Legacy SVGA Resolution Aspect Ratio Comment 800 by 600 4 colon 3 Super Video Graphics Array Introduced in 1989 Still supported on some platforms HD Resolution Aspect Ratio Comment 1280 by 720 16 colon 9 High Definition Also known as 720p FHD Resolution Aspect Ratio Comment 1920 by 1080 16 colon 9 Full High Definition Also known as 1080p Good setting for typical user QHD Resolution Aspect Ratio Comment 2560 by 1440 16 colon 9 Quad High Definition Also known as 1440p Suggested resolution for high-end users and gamers UHD Resolution Aspect Ratio Comment 3840 times 2160 greater than 16 colon 9 Ultra High Definition Also known as 4K 
Incomplete 3.3.4.4 using multiple monitors. 3.3.4.4 using multiple monitors. Adding monitors can increase your visual desktop area and improve productivity. The added monitors enable you to expand the size of the monitor or duplicate the desktop so you can view additional windows. For example, the woman in the figure below is using multiple displays. She is using the right monitor to make changes to a website and the left monitor to display the resulting change. She is also using a laptop to display a library of images she is considering for inclusion in the website. Many computers have built-in support for multiple monitors. To connect multiple monitors to a computer, you need the supporting cables. Then you need to enable your computer to support multiple monitors. For example, on a Windows 10 host, right-click anywhere on the desktop and choose Display Settings. This should open the display window as shown in the figure. In the example, the user has two monitors connected in the configuration displayed. The current monitor selected is in blue and has a resolution of 1920 by 1080. It is also the main display monitor. Clicking on monitor 2 would display its resolutions. Incomplete 3.3.4.5 Check your understanding monitor terminology. 3.3.4.5 Check your understanding monitor terminology. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the monitor terminology with the respective description. Contrast ratio. Pixel. Resolution. Screen size. Native resolution. Dot pitch. Aspect ratio. This is the distance between pixels on the screen. Measured diagonally from top to bottom in inches. In Windows 10, this is identified using the keyword, recommended. An example is 1920 horizontal pixels by 1080 vertical pixels. For 500 colon 1 displays brighter whites and darker blacks than 1.000 colon 1. For colon 3 is older while 16 colon 9 is newer. More of these dots means the monitor can display more detail. Submit. 3.3.4.5 Check your understanding. Monitor. Three point four computer configuration. Scroll to begin. Incomplete three point four point one upgrade computer hardware. Incomplete three dot four dot one dot one motherboard upgrade. Three dot four dot one dot one motherboard upgrade. Computers need periodic upgrades for various reasons. User requirements change. Upgraded software packages require new hardware. New hardware offers enhanced performance. Changes to the computer may cause you to upgrade or replace components and peripherals. Research the effectiveness and cost of both upgrading and replacing. If you upgrade or replace a motherboard, consider that you might have to replace other components including the CPU, heat sink and fan assembly, and RAM. A new motherboard must also fit into the old computer case and the power supply must support it. When upgrading the motherboard, begin the upgrade by moving the CPU and the heat sink and fan assembly to the new motherboard if they will be reused. These items are much easier to work with when they are outside of the case. 
Work on an antistatic mat and wear antistatic gloves or an antistatic wrist strap to avoid damaging the CPU. If the new motherboard requires a different CPU and RAM, install them at this time. Clean the thermal compound from the CPU and heat sink. Remember to reapply thermal compound between the CPU and the heat sink. In the figure, select the components that are impacted by a motherboard upgrade. Upgrade Incomplete 3.4.1.2 steps to upgrade a motherboard. 3.4.1.2 steps to upgrade a motherboard. Before beginning an upgrade, ensure that you know where and how everything is connected. Always make notes in a journal to record how the current computer is set up. A quick way is to use a cell phone and take pictures of important items such as how components connect to the motherboard. These pictures may prove to be surprisingly helpful when reassembling. To upgrade a motherboard from a computer case, follow these steps. Step 1. Record how the power supply, case fans, case LEDs, and case buttons attach to the old motherboard. Step 2. Disconnect the cables from the old motherboard. Step 3. Disconnect the expansion cards from the case. Remove each expansion card and place them in anti-static bags or on an anti-static mat. Step 4. Carefully record how the old motherboard is secured to the case. Some mounting screws provide support while some may provide an important grounding connection between the motherboard and chassis. In particular, pay attention to screws and standoffs that are non-metallic, because these may be insulators. Replacing insulating screws and supports with metal hardware that conducts electricity might damage electrical components. Step 5. Remove the old motherboard from the case. Step 6. Examine the new motherboard and identify where all of the connectors are such as power, SATA, fan, USB, audio, front panel connector, and any others. Step 7. Examine the I.O. shield located at the back of the computer case. Replace the old I.O. shield with the I.O. shield that comes with the new motherboard. Step 8. Insert and secure the motherboard into the case. Be sure to consult the case and motherboard manufacturer user guides. Use the proper types of screws. Do not swap threaded screws with self-tapping metal screws because they will damage the threaded screw holes and might not be secure. Make sure that the threaded screws are the correct length and have the same number of threads per inch. If the thread is correct, they fit easily. If you force a screw to fit, you can damage the threaded hole, and it will not hold the motherboard securely. Using the wrong screw can also produce metal shavings that can cause short circuits. Step 9. Next, connect the power supply, case fans, case LEDs, front panel, and any other required cables. If the ATX power connectors are not the same size, some have more pins than others, you might need to use an adapter. Refer to the motherboard documentation for the layout of these connections. Step 10. After the new motherboard is in place and the cables are connected, install and secure the expansion cards. It is now time to check your work. Make sure that there are no loose parts or unconnected cables. Connect the keyboard, mouse, monitor, and power. If a problem is detected, shut the power supply off immediately. 
Incomplete 3.4.1.3 CPU Upgrade 3.4.1.3 CPU Upgrade One way to increase the power of a computer is to increase the processing speed. You can do this by upgrading the CPU. However, the CPU must meet the requirements listed in the figure. The new CPU might require a different heat sink and fan assembly. The assembly must physically fit the CPU and be compatible with the CPU socket. It must also be adequate to remove the heat of the faster CPU. Caution, you must apply thermal compound between the new CPU and the heat sink and fan assembly. View thermal settings in the BIOS to determine if there are any problems with the CPU and the heat sink and fan assembly. Third-party software applications can also report CPU temperature information in an easy-to-read format. Refer to the motherboard or CPU user documentation to determine if the chip is operating in the correct temperature range. To install additional fans in the case to help cool the computer, follow these steps. Step 1. Align the fan so that it faces the correct direction to either draw air in or blow air out. Step 2. Mount the fan using the pre-drilled holes in the case. It is common to mount fans near the top of the case to blow hot air out and near the bottom of the case to bring air in. Avoid mounting two fans close together that are moving air in opposite directions. Step 3. Connect the fan to the power supply or the motherboard, depending on the case fan plug type. Requirements The new CPU must fit into the existing CPU socket. The new CPU must be compatible with the motherboard chipset. The new CPU must operate with the existing motherboard and power supply. Incomplete 3.4.1.4 Storage Device Upgrade 3.4.1.4 Storage Device Upgrade Instead of purchasing a new computer to get faster speed and more storage space, you might consider adding another hard drive. There are several reasons for installing an additional drive as listed in the figure. After selecting the appropriate hard drive for the computer, follow these general guidelines during installation. Step 1. Place the hard drive in an empty drive bay and tighten the screws to secure the hard drive. Step 2. Connect the drive to the motherboard using the correct cable. Step 3. Attach the power cable to the drive. Reasons for new drive Increase storage space Increase hard drive speed Install a second operating system Store the system swap file Provide fault tolerance Back up the original hard drive Incomplete 3.4.1.5 Peripheral Upgrades 3.4.1.5 Peripheral Upgrades Peripheral devices periodically need to be upgraded. For example, if the device stops operating or if you wish to improve performance and productivity, an upgrade might be necessary. These are a few reasons for upgrading a keyboard and or a mouse. Change the keyboard and mouse to an ergonomic design such as those shown in the figure below. Ergonomic devices are made to be more comfortable to use and to help prevent repetitive motion injuries. Reconfigure the keyboard to accommodate a special task, such as typing in a second language with additional characters. To accommodate users with disabilities. However, sometimes it is not possible to perform an upgrade using the existing expansion slots or sockets. In this case, you may be able to accomplish the upgrade using a USB connection. 
If the computer does not have an extra USB connection, you must install a USB adapter card or purchase a USB hub, as shown below. Incomplete 3.4.1.6 Power Supply Upgrade 3.4.1.6 Power Supply Upgrade Upgrading your computer hardware will most likely also change its power needs. If so, you may need to upgrade your power supply. You can find calculators on the internet to help you determine if you need to upgrade the power supply. Search for Power Supply Wattage Calculator. In addition to upgrading for additional power, a computer may be capable of having two power supplies. One acts as a redundant power supply in case of failure. A special motherboard must be used to take advantage of this configuration. This configuration is not often found with desktop computers. It is more commonly used in servers. This allows both power supplies to be hot swappable. The faulty power supply can be replaced without losing power to the computer. Incomplete 3.4.1.7 Lab Research a Hardware Upgrade 3.4.1.7 Lab Research a Hardware Upgrade in this lab, you will gather information about hardware components so you can upgrade your customer's hardware so they can play advanced video games. Research a hardware upgrade. Previous.
3.5 Protecting the Environment Scroll to begin. Incomplete 3.5.1 Safe Disposal of Equipment and Supplies Incomplete 3.5.1.1 Safe Disposal Methods 3.5.1.1 Safe Disposal Methods after upgrading a computer or replacing a broken device, what do you do with the leftover parts? If the parts are still good, they can be donated or sold. Parts that no longer work must be disposed of, but they must be disposed of responsibly. The proper disposal or recycling of hazardous computer components is a global issue. Make sure to follow regulations that govern how to dispose of specific items. Organizations that violate these regulations can be fined or face expensive legal battles. Regulations for the disposal of the items on this page vary from state to state and from country to country. Check your local environmental regulatory agency. Batteries Batteries often contain rare earth metals that can be harmful to the environment. These metals do not decay and remain in the environment for many years. Mercury is commonly used in the manufacturing of batteries and is extremely harmful to humans. Recycling batteries should be standard practice. All batteries are subject to disposal procedures that comply with local environmental regulations. Monitors Handle CRT monitors with care. Extremely high voltage can be stored in CRT monitors even after being disconnected from a power source. Monitors contain glass, metal, plastics, lead, barium, and rare earth metals. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, monitors can contain approximately 4 pounds, 1.8 kilograms, of lead. Monitors must be disposed of in compliance with environmental regulations. Toner kits, cartridges, and developers. Used printer toner kits and printer cartridges must be disposed of properly in compliance with environmental regulations. They can also be recycled. Some toner cartridge suppliers and manufacturers take empty cartridges for refilling. Kits to refill inkjet printer cartridges are available but are not recommended because the ink might leak into the printer, causing irreparable damage. Using refilled inkjet cartridges might also void the inkjet printer warranty. Chemical solvents and aerosol cans Contact the local sanitation company to learn how and where to dispose of the chemicals and solvents used to clean computers. Never dump chemicals or solvents down a sink or dispose of them in a drain that connects to public sewers. Cell phones and tablets. 
The EPA recommends individuals check with local health and sanitation agencies for their preferred way to dispose of electronics such as cell phones, tablets, and computers. Most computer equipment and mobile devices contain hazardous materials, such as heavy metals, that do not belong in a landfill because they contaminate the earth. Local communities may also have recycling programs. Incomplete 3.5.1.2 Safety Data Sheets 3.5.1.2 Safety Data Sheets Hazardous materials are sometimes called toxic waste. These materials can contain high concentrations of heavy metals such as cadmium, lead, or mercury. The regulations for the disposal of hazardous materials vary by state or country. Contact the local recycling or waste removal authorities in your community for information about disposal procedures and services. A Safety Data Sheet, SDS, formerly known as a Material Safety and Data Sheet, MSDS, is a fact sheet that summarizes information about material identification, including hazardous ingredients that can affect personal health, fire hazards, and first aid requirements. The SDS contains chemical reactivity and incompatibility information. It also includes protective measures for the safe handling and storage of materials and spill, leak, and disposal procedures. To determine if a material is classified as hazardous, consult the manufacturer's SDS which in the U.S. is required by OSHA when the material is transferred to a new owner. The SDS explains how to dispose of potentially hazardous materials in the safest manner. Always check local regulations concerning acceptable disposal methods before disposing of any electronic equipment. In the European Union, the regulation registration, evaluation, authorization and restriction of chemicals, REACH, came into effect on June 1, 2007, replacing various directives and regulations with a single system. Incomplete 3.5.1.3 Check Your Understanding, Safe Disposal 3.5.1.3 Check Your Understanding, Safe Disposal Matching Select from lists and then submit. Select true or false for the statements about Disposal Regulation Disposal regulation CR Select true or false for the statements about safe disposal. Disposal regulations vary from state to state and country to country. True CRT monitors may contain dangerously high voltage after being unplugged. It is acceptable to dispose of small mobile devices, such as cell phones, in landfills. Please select an option. True. False. OSHA requires that all hazardous materials be accompanied by an SD SDS. True.
3.6 Summary Scroll to begin. Incomplete 3.6.1 Conclusion Incomplete 3.6.1.1 Chapter 3 Advanced Computer Hardware 3.6.1.1 Chapter 3 Advanced Computer Hardware In this chapter, you learned about the computer boot process and the role played by the BIOS which performs the post on the main components of the computer. You also learned that the motherboard BIOS settings are saved in a CMOS memory chip. When a computer boots, the BIOS software reads the configured settings stored in CMOS to determine how to configure the hardware. In the lab, you installed Microsoft Windows operating system and third-party software. After installing Windows, you learned about wattage and voltage and the basic equation of Ohm's law, which expresses how voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance, V equals IR, and that power is equal to the voltage multiplied by the current P equals 6. You learned about the types of AC power fluctuations that can cause data loss or hardware failure like blackouts, brownouts, noise, spikes, and power surges. You also learned about the devices that help shield against power fluctuation problems and protect the data and computer equipment. These devices include surge protectors, UPS, and SPS. Next, you learned about multi-core processors ranging from dual-core CPUs with two cores inside a single CPU to octa-core CPUs with eight cores inside a single CPU and different types of CPU cooling mechanisms like fans, heat sinks, and water cooling systems. In addition to multi-core CPUs, you learned how multiple drives can be logically grouped and managed to create large storage volumes with redundancy using RAID technology. Striping, mirroring, parity, and double parity types of RAID were covered. Covered you learned about many different types of computer ports and connectors starting with legacy ports that are typically found on older computers such as serial, parallel, game, PS-2 and audio ports, most of which are replaced by newer technologies like USB. You also learned about various video and game ports like VGA, DVI, HDMI and display ports used to connect monitors and external video displays. The evolution of USB ports was covered as well and included comparisons of USB Type-A, Mini-USB, Micro-USB, USB Type-B, USB, type USB Type-C, and Lightning connectors. The characteristics that define computer monitors was covered. You learned that monitors vary by use, size, quality, clarity, and brightness. You also learned that monitors are described by their screen size as measured diagonally and screen resolution as measured by the number of pixels. Display standards of CGA, VGA, SVGA, HD, FHD, QHD, and UHD were all defined as well. The chapter concluded with a discussion on protecting the environment through safe disposal methods for computer components. You learned that there are regulations for the disposal of many of these components such as batteries, toner, printer cartridges, cell phones, and tablets. You also learned about the SDS which explains how to dispose of potentially hazardous materials in the safest manner. Always check local regulations concerning acceptable disposal methods before disposing of any electronic equipment. Incomplete 3.6.1.2 Advanced Computer Hardware 3.6.1.2 Advanced Computer Hardware Incomplete Question 1 Multiple Choice Question Which hardware upgrade would allow the processor in a gaming PC to provide the optimal gaming performance?
performance? Incomplete question 2. Multiple choice question. Which term refers to the technique of increasing the speed of a processor from the specified value of its manufacturer? Incomplete question 3. Multiple choice question. When a dual-core CPU with hyper-threading features is installed on a motherboard, how many instructions can the CPU simultaneously process? In Incomplete question 4. Multiple choice question. Which website should a technician consult to find instructions for updating the BIOS on a computer? Incomplete question 5. Multiple choice question. Where is the saved BIOS configuration data stored? Incomplete question 6. Which definition describes the term overclocking? Amendations of the manufacturer. Which device can protect computer equipment from brownouts by providing a consistent quality of electrical power? Incomplete question 8. Multiple choice question. What is a characteristic of thin clients? Incomplete question 9. Multiple choice question. What unit is used to measure the amount of resistance to the flow of current in a circuit? Incomplete question 10. Multiple choice question. What indicates that the charge on the CMOS battery could be getting low? Incomplete question 11. Multiple choice question. Which specialized computer component would be most important for a workstation built for audio and video editing? Incomplete question 12. Multiple choice question. A technician accidentally spills a cleaning solution on the floor of the workshop. Where would the technician find instructions on how to properly clean up and dispose of the product? Incomplete question 13. Multiple choice question. What are two settings that can be modified in the BIOS setup program? program. Choose 2. Incomplete question 14. Multiple choice question. A network administrator is setting up a web server for a small advertising office and is concerned with data availability. The administrator wishes to implement disk fault tolerance using the minimum number of disks required. Which RAID level should the administrator choose?
4.0 Introduction Scroll to begin. Complete 4.0.1 Welcome. Complete 4.0.1.1 Chapter 4 Preventive Maintenance and Troubleshooting. 4.0.1.1 Chapter 4 Preventive Maintenance and Troubleshooting. Preventive maintenance is something that is often overlooked, but good IT professionals understand the importance of regular and systematic inspection, cleaning, and replacement of worn parts, materials, and systems. Effective preventive maintenance reduces part, material, and system faults, and keeps hardware and software in good working condition. Preventive maintenance doesn't just apply to hardware. Performing basic tasks like checking what programs run on startup, scanning for malware, and removing unused programs helps a computer function more efficiently and can keep it from slowing down. Good IT professionals also understand the importance of troubleshooting which requires an organized and logical approach to problems with computers and other components. In this chapter, you will learn general guidelines for creating preventive maintenance programs and troubleshooting procedures. These guidelines are a starting point to help you develop your preventive maintenance and troubleshooting skills. You will also learn the importance of maintaining an optimal operating environment for computer systems that are clean, free of potential contaminants, and within the temperature and humidity range specified by the manufacturer. At the end of the chapter, you will learn the six-step troubleshooting process and common problems and solutions for different computer components. Home. Now. 4.1 Preventive Maintenance. 1 Preventive Maintenance. Scroll to begin. Incomplete 4.1.1 PC Preventive Maintenance Overview Incomplete 4.1.1.1 Benefits to Preventive Maintenance 4.1.1.1 Benefits to Preventive Maintenance Preventive maintenance plans are developed based on at least two factors. Computer location or environment, dusty environments, such as construction sites, requires more attention than an office environment. Computer use, high traffic networks, such as a school network, might require additional scanning and removal of malicious software and unwanted files. Regular preventive maintenance. Reduces potential hardware and software problems, computer downtime, repair costs, and the number of equipment failures. Improves data protection, equipment life and stability, and saves money. Incomplete 4.1.1.2 Preventive Maintenance, Dust 4.1.1.2 Preventive Maintenance, Dust the following are considerations to keep dust from damaging computer components. Clean-slash-replace building air filters regularly to reduce the amount of dust in the air. Use a cloth or a duster to clean the outside of the computer case. If using a cleaning product, put a small amount onto a cleaning cloth and then wipe the outside of the case. Dust on the outside of a computer can travel through cooling fans to the inside. Accumulated dust prevents the flow of air and reduces the cooling of components. Hot computer components are more likely to break down. Remove dust from the inside of a computer using a combination of compressed air, a low airflow ESD vacuum cleaner, and a small lint-free cloth. Keep the can of compressed air upright to prevent the fluid from leaking onto computer components. Keep the compressed air can a safe distance from sensitive devices and components. Use the lint-free cloth to remove any dust left behind on the component. 
Caution, when you clean a fan with compressed air, hold the fan blades in place. This prevents overspinning the rotor or moving the fan in the wrong direction. Direction Incomplete 4.1.1.3 Preventive Maintenance, Internal Components 4.1.1.3 Preventive Maintenance, Internal Components This is a basic checklist of components to inspect for dust and damage. CPU heat sink and fan assembly, the fan should spin freely, the fan power cable should be secure, and the fan should turn when the power is on. RAM modules, the modules must be seated securely in the RAM slots. Ensure that the retaining clips are not loose. Storage devices, all cables should be firmly connected. Check for loose, missing, or incorrectly set jumpers. A drive should not produce rattling, knocking, or grinding sounds. Screws. A loose screw in the case can cause a short circuit. Adapter cards. Ensure that they are seated properly and secured with the retaining screws in their expansion slots. Loose cards can cause short circuits. Missing expansion slot covers can let dust, dirt, or living pests inside the computer. Cables. Examine all cable connections. Ensure that pins are not broken and bent and that cables are not crimped, pinched, or severely bent. Retaining screws should be finger tight. Power devices. Inspect power strips, surge suppressors, surge protectors, and UPS devices. Make sure that the devices work properly and that there is clear ventilation. Keyboard and mouse. Use compressed air to clean the keyboard, mouse, and mouse sensor. Incomplete 4.1.1.4 Preventive Maintenance, Environmental Concerns. 4.1.1.4 Preventive Maintenance, Environmental Concerns An optimal operating environment for a computer is clean, free of potential contaminants, and within the temperature and humidity range specified by the manufacturer. Follow these guidelines to help ensure optimal computer operating performance. Do not obstruct vents or airflow to the internal components. Keep the room temperature between 45 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 7 to 32 degrees Celsius. Keep the humidity level between 10 and 80 percent. Temperature and humidity recommendations vary by computer manufacturer. Research the recommended values for computers used in extreme conditions. Optimal operating conditions. Between 10% and 80% humidity. Between 45 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 7.2 to 32.2 degrees Celsius. Incomplete 4.1.1.5 Preventive Maintenance Software. 4.1.1.5 Preventive Maintenance Software Verify that installed software is current. Follow the policies of the organization when installing security updates, operating system, and program updates. Create a software maintenance schedule to Review and install the appropriate security, software, and driver updates. Update the virus definition files and scan for viruses and spyware. Remove unwanted or unused programs. Scan hard drives for errors and defragment hard drives. Incomplete 4.1.1.6 Check your understanding, preventive maintenance. 
4.1.1.6 Check your understanding. Preventive maintenance. Incomplete question 1. This is a multiple choice. What four tools would be This is a multiple choice question. Once you have selected an option, select the submit button below. What four tools would be required by a technician when performing preventive maintenance on a desktop PC? Choose four. Four. Reset. Show feedback. Incomplete question two. This is a multiple choice question. Once you have selected an option, select the submit button below. Which two issues are primarily related to cables inside a PC? Choose two. Two. Submit. Show feedback. Incomplete question 3. Multiple choice question. Which three benefits result from doing frequent preventive maintenance on desktop PCs? Choose three. Three. Reset. Show feedback. Incomplete question four. This is a multiple choice question. Once you have selected an option, select the submit button below. A mining employee spends much of the time working with a laptop down in the mine. What three factors would be of most concern to a technician when doing preventive maintenance on the laptop? Choose three. Submit. Submit. Show feedback. Incomplete question 5. This is a multiple choice question. Once you have selected an option, select the submit button below. True or false? A technician forgot an anti-static mat for doing a preventive maintenance on a PC in the reception area. 
Since the reception area does not have carpet, it is an acceptable solution to take off shoes and work in socks instead of wasting valuable time returning to the office for the mat. Four point two troubleshooting process. Scroll to begin. Incomplete four point two point one troubleshooting process steps. Incomplete four dot two dot one dot one introduction to troubleshooting. Four dot two dot one dot one introduction to troubleshooting. Troubleshooting requires an organized and logical approach to problems with computers and other components. Sometimes issues arise during preventive maintenance. At other times, a customer may contact you with a problem. A logical approach to troubleshooting allows you to eliminate variables and identify causes of problems in a systematic order. Asking the right questions, testing the right hardware, and examining the right data helps you understand the problem and form a proposed solution. Troubleshooting is a skill that you refine over time. Each time you solve a problem, you increase your troubleshooting skills by gaining more experience. You learn how and when to combine steps or skip steps to reach a solution quickly. The troubleshooting process is a guideline that is modified to fit your needs. This section presents an approach to problem solving that you can apply to both hardware and software. Note, the term customer, as used in this course, is any user that requires technical computer assistance. Before you begin troubleshooting problems, always follow the necessary precautions to protect data on a computer. Some repairs, such as replacing a hard drive or reinstalling an operating system, might put the data on the computer at risk. Make sure you do everything possible to prevent data loss while attempting repairs. If your work results in data loss for the customer, you or your company could be held liable. Data Backup A data backup is a copy of the data on a computer hard drive that is saved to another storage device or to cloud storage. Cloud storage is online storage that is accessed via the Internet. In an organization, backups may be performed on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. If you are unsure that a backup has been done, do not attempt any troubleshooting activities until you check with the customer. Here is a list of items to verify with the customer that a backup has been performed. Date of the last backup. Contents of the backup. Data integrity of the backup. Availability of all backup media for a data restore. If the customer does not have a current backup and you are not able to create one, ask the customer to sign a liability release form. A liability release form contains at least the following information. Permission to work on the computer without a current backup available. Release from liability if data is lost or corrupted. Description of the work to be performed. Incomplete 4.2.1.2 Troubleshooting Process Steps 4.2.1.2 Troubleshooting Process Steps Troubleshooting Process Steps Step 1. Identify the problem. Step 2. Establish a theory of probable cause. Step 3. 
Test the theory to determine the cause. Step 4. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. Step 5. Verify full system functionality and if applicable, implement preventive measures. Step 6. Document findings, actions, and outcomes. Incomplete 4.2.1.3 Identify the problem. 4.2.1.3 Identify the problem. The first step in the troubleshooting process is to identify the problem. During this step, gather as much information as possible from the customer and from the computer. Conversation etiquette. When you are talking to the customer, follow these guidelines. Ask direct questions to gather information. Do not use industry jargon. Do not talk down to the customer. Do not insult the customer. Do not accuse the customer of causing the problem. The table below lists some of the information to gather from the customer. Step 1. Identify the problem. Customer information. Company name. Contact name. Address. Phone number. Computer configuration. Manufacturer and model. Operating system. Network environment. Connection type. Problem description. Open-ended questions. Closed-ended questions. Error messages. Beep sequences. LEDs. Post. Open-ended and closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions allow customers to explain the details of the problem in their own words. Use open-ended questions to obtain general information. Based on the information from the customer, you can proceed with closed-ended questions. Closed-ended questions generally require a yes or no answer. Documenting responses. Document the information from the customer in the work order, in the repair log, and in your repair journal. Write down anything that you think might be important for you or another technician. The small details often lead to the solution of a difficult or complicated problem. Beep codes. Each BIOS manufacturer has a unique beep sequence, a combination of long and short beeps for hardware failures. When troubleshooting, power on the computer and listen. As the system proceeds through the post, most computers emit one beep to indicate that the system is booting properly. If there is an error, you might hear multiple beeps. Document the beep code sequence and research the code to determine the specific problem. BIOS information If the computer boots and stops after the post, investigate the BIOS settings. A device might not be detected or configured properly. Refer to the motherboard documentation to ensure that the BIOS settings are correct. Diagnostic tools Conduct research to determine which software is available to help diagnose and solve problems. There are many programs to help you troubleshoot hardware. Manufacturers of system hardware usually provide diagnostic tools of their own. For instance, a hard drive manufacturer might provide a tool to boot the computer and diagnose why the hard drive does not start the operating system. A tabbed content container. Content can be text, graphic, or both. Select each Microsoft Windows component to learn more. Event Viewer When system, user, or software errors occur on a computer, the Event Viewer is updated with information about the errors. 
The Event Viewer application records the following information about the problem. What problem occurred? Date and time of the problem. Severity of the problem. Source of the problem. Event ID number. Which user was logged in when the problem occurred? Although the event viewer lists details about the error, you might need to further research the problem to determine a solution. Device Manager The Device Manager displays all the devices that are configured on a computer. The operating system flags the devices that are not operating correctly with an error icon. A yellow triangle with an exclamation point indicates that the device is in a problem state. A red X means that the device is disabled, removed, or Windows can't locate the device. An arrow down means the device has been disabled. A yellow question mark indicates that the system does not know which driver to install for the hardware. Event Viewer Device Manager Task Manager the task manager displays the applications and background processes that are currently running. With the task manager, you can close applications that have stopped responding. You can also monitor the performance of the CPU and virtual memory, view all processes that are currently running, and view information about the network connections. Event for .2.1.4, check your understanding, identify the problem. Matching. Select from lists and then submit. Match the question a technician might ask the customer to the question type. What problems are you experiencing with your computer or network? Network? Open-ended question. Question. What were you doing when the problem was identified? Identify? Open-ended question. What software has been installed on your computer recently? Recently? Open-ended question. What hardware changes have been made recently to your computer? Please select an option. T computer? Open-ended question. Can you reproduce the problem? Problem? Closed-ended question. Are you currently logged into the network? Network? Closed-ended question. Question. Have you changed your password recently? Closed-ended question. Has, has anyone else used your computer recently? Closed-ended question. Have you received any error messages on your computer? Computer? Closed-ended question.
Question. Reset. Show feedback. Complete 4.2.1.5 Establish a theory of probable cause. 4.2.1.5 Establish a theory of probable cause. The second step in the troubleshooting process is to establish a theory of probable cause. First, create a list of the most common reasons for the error. Even though the customer may think that there is a major problem, start with the obvious issues before moving to more complex diagnoses. List the easiest or most obvious causes at the top. List the more complex causes at the bottom. If necessary, conduct internal, logs, journal, or external, internet, research based on the symptoms. The next steps of the troubleshooting process involve testing each possible cause. Step 2. Establish a theory of probable cause. Device is powered off. Power switch for an outlet is turned off. Surge protector is turned off. Loose external cable connections. Non-bootable disk in designated boot drive. Incorrect boot order in BIOS setup. Incomplete 4.2.1.6 tests the theory to determine the cause. 4.2.1.6 tests the theory to determine the cause. You can determine an exact cause by testing your theories of probable causes one at a time, starting with the quickest and easiest. The table below identifies some common steps to determine the cause of the problem. Once the theory is confirmed, you then determine the steps to resolve the problem. As you become more experienced at troubleshooting computers, you will work through the steps in the process faster. For now, practice each step to better understand the troubleshooting process. Step 3. Test the theory to determine the cause. Common steps to determine cause. Ensure the device is powered on. Ensure the power switch for an outlet is turned on. Ensure the surge protector is turned on. Ensure external cable connections are secure. Ensure that the designated boot drive is bootable. Verify the boot order in BIOS setup. If you cannot determine the exact cause of the problem after testing all your theories, establish a new theory of probable cause and test it. If necessary, escalate the problem to a technician with more experience. Before you escalate, document each test that you tried, as shown in the work order below. Incomplete 4.2.1.7 Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. 4.2.1.7 Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. After you have determined the exact cause of the problem, establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. Sometimes quick procedures can correct the problem. If a quick procedure does correct the problem, verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures. If a quick procedure does not correct the problem, research the problem further and then return to step 2 to establish a new theory of the probable cause. Note, always consider corporate policies, procedures, and impacts before implementing any changes. After you have established a plan of action, you should research possible solutions. The figure lists possible research locations. Divide larger problems into smaller problems that can be analyzed and solved individually. Prioritize solutions starting with the easiest and fastest to implement. Create a list of possible solutions and implement them one at a time. If you implement a possible solution and it does not correct the problem, reverse the action you just took and then try another solution. 
Continue this process until you have found the appropriate solution. Step 4. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. If no solution is achieved in the previous step, further research is needed to implement the solution. Help desk repair logs. Other technicians. Manufacturer FAQ websites. Technical websites. News groups. Computer manuals. Device manuals. Online forums. Internet search. Complete 4.2.1.8 verify full functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures. 4.2.1.8 verify full functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures. After the repairs to the computer have been completed, continue the troubleshooting process by verifying full system functionality and implementing the preventive measures needed. Verifying full system functionality confirms that you have solved the original problem and ensures that you have not created another problem while repairing the computer. Whenever possible, have the customer verify the solution and system functionality. Step 5. Verify full system functionality and if applicable implement preventive measures. Reboot the computer. Ensure multiple applications work properly. Verify network and internet connections. Print a document from one application. Ensure all attached devices work properly. Ensure no error messages are received. Incomplete 4.2.1.9 Document Findings, Actions, and Outcomes 4.2.1.9 Document Findings, Actions, and Outcomes After the repairs to the computer have been completed, finish the troubleshooting process with the customer. Explain the problem and the solution to the customer verbally and in writing. The figure shows the steps to take when you have finished a repair. Verify the solution with the customer. If the customer is available, demonstrate how the solution has corrected the computer problem. Have the customer test the solution and try to reproduce the problem. When the customer can verify that the problem has been resolved, you can complete the documentation for the repair in the work order and in your journal. Include the following information in the documentation. Description of the problem. Steps to resolve the problem. Components used in the repair. Step 6. Document findings, actions, and outcomes. Discuss the solution implemented with the customer. Have the customer verify that the problem has been solved. Provide the customer with all paperwork. 4.2.1.10 Check your understanding. Number the steps. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the troubleshooting step in correct order. Test the theory to determine the cause. Identify the problem. Document findings, actions, and outcomes. Establish a theory of probable cause. Verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement a solution. Step 1. Step 2. Step 3. Step 4. Step 5. Step 6. Submit.
Complete 4.2.2.1 PC comma Complete 4.2.2.2 Common Problems and Solutions for PCs Complete 4.2.2.1 PC Common Problems and Solutions 4.2.2.1 PC Common Problems and Solutions Computer problems can be attributed to hardware, software, networks, or some combination of the three. You will resolve some types of problems more often than others. These are some common hardware problems. Storage device. Storage device problems are often related to loose or incorrect cable connections, incorrect drive and media formats, and incorrect jumper and BIOS settings. Motherboard and internal components. These problems are often caused by incorrect or loose cables, failed components, incorrect drivers, and corrupted updates. Power supply. Power problems are often caused by a faulty power supply, loose connections, and inadequate wattage. CPU and memory. Processor and memory problems are often caused by faulty installations, incorrect BIOS settings, inadequate cooling and ventilation, and compatibility issues. Displays. Display problems are often caused by incorrect settings, loose connections, and incorrect or corrupted drivers. Incomplete 4.2.2.2 Common Problems and Solutions for Storage Devices 4.2.2.2 Common Problems and Solutions for Storage Devices List of Expandable Sections Select each button to expand the content. Select each problem for a list of probable causes and possible solutions. The computer does not recognize a storage device. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The power cable is loose. Secure the power cable. The data cable is loose. Secure the data cable. The jumpers are set incorrectly. Reset the jumpers. A storage device failed. Replace the storage device. The storage device settings in BIOS are incorrect. Reset the storage device settings in BIOS. The computer does not recognize an optical disk. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The disk is inserted upside down. Insert the disk correctly. There is more than one disk inserted in the drive. Ensure that there is only one disk inserted in the drive. The disk is damaged. Replace the disk. The disk is in the wrong format. Use the correct type of disk. The optical drive is faulty. Replace the optical drive. The computer will not eject the optical disk. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The optical drive is jammed. Insert a pin in the small hole next to the eject button on the drive to open the drive. The optical drive has been locked by software. Reboot the computer. The optical drive is faulty. Replace the optical drive. The computer does not recognize a removable external drive. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The removable external drive is not seated properly. Remove and reinsert the drive. The external ports are disabled in the BIOS settings. Enable the ports in the BIOS settings. 
The removable external drive is faulty. Replace the removable external drive. A media reader cannot read a memory card that works properly. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The media reader does not support the memory card type. Use a different memory card type. The media reader is not connected correctly. Ensure the media reader is connected correctly in the computer. The media reader is not configured properly in the BIOS settings. Reconfigure the media reader in the BIOS settings. The media reader is faulty. Install a known good media reader. Retrieving or saving data from the USB flash drive is slow. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The motherboard does not support USB 3.0. Replace the motherboard with a USB 3.0 capable motherboard or add a USB 3.0 expansion card. The port is set to full speed in the BIOS settings. Set the port speed in the BIOS settings to high speed. Incomplete 4.2.2.3 Common Problems and Solutions for Motherboards and Internal Components 4.2.2.3 Common Problems and Solutions for Motherboards and Internal Components List of Expandable Sections Select each button to expand the content. Select each problem for a list of probable causes and possible solutions. The clock on the computer is no longer keeping the correct time or the BIOS settings are changing when the computer is rebooted. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The CMOS battery may be loose. Secure the battery. The CMOS battery may be drained. Replace the battery. After updating the BIOS firmware, the computer will not start. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The BIOS firmware update did not install correctly. Contact the motherboard manufacturer to obtain a new BIOS chip. If the motherboard has two BIOS chips, the second BIOS chip can be used. The computer displays the incorrect CPU information when the computer boots. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The CPU settings are not correct in the advanced BIOS settings. Set the advanced BIOS settings correctly for the CPU. BIOS does not properly recognize the CPU. Update the BIOS. The hard drive LED on the front of the computer does not light. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The hard drive LED cable is not connected or is loose. Reconnect hard drive LED cable to motherboard. The hard drive LED cable is incorrectly oriented to the front case panel connections. Correctly orient the hard drive LED cable to the front case panel connection and reconnect. The built-in NIC has stopped working. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The NIC hardware has failed. Install a new NIC into an open expansion slot. The computer does not display any video after installing a new PCIe video card. Probable causes. Possible solutions. BIOS settings are set to use the built-in video. Disable the built-in video in the BIOS settings. The monitor cable is still connected to the built-in video. Connect the monitor cable to the new video card. 
The new video card needs auxiliary power. Connect any required power connectors to the video card. The new video card is faulty. Install a known good video card. The new sound card does not work. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The speakers are not connected to the correct jack. Connect the speakers to the correct jack. The audio is muted. Unmute the audio. The sound card is faulty. Install a known good sound card. BIOS settings are set to use the onboard sound device. Disable the onboard audio device in the BIOS settings. System attempts to boot to an incorrect device. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Media was left in a removable drive. Boot order configured incorrectly. Check that the removable drives do not contain media that is interfering with the boot process and check that the boot order is configured correctly. User can hear fans spinning but the computer does not start and there are no beeps from the speaker. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Post procedure is not executing. Faulting cabling, damaged or misseated CPU or other motherboard component. Motherboard capacitors are distended, swollen, emitting residue, or bulging. Incomplete 4.2.2.4 Common Problems and Solutions for Power Supplies Probable Causes Possible Solutions Heat, ESP, Power Surge, or Spike Replace Motherboard Incomplete 4.2.2.4 Common Problems and Solutions for Power Supplies 4.2.2.4 Common Problems and Solutions for Power Supplies List of Expandable Sections Select each button to expand the content. Select each problem for a list of probable causes and possible solutions. The computer will not turn on. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The computer is not plugged into the AC outlet. Plug the computer into a known good AC outlet. The AC outlet is faulty. Plug the computer into a known good AC outlet. The power cord is faulty. Use a known good power cord. The power supply switch is not turned on. Turn on the power supply switch. The power supply switch is set to the incorrect voltage. Set the power supply switch to the correct voltage setting. The power button is not connected correctly to the front panel connector. Correctly orient the power button to the front case panel connector and reconnect. The power supply has failed. Install a known good power supply. The computer reboots, turns off unexpectedly, or there is smoke or the smell of burning electronics. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The power supply is starting to fail. Replace the power supply. Incomplete 4.2.2.5 Common Problems and Solutions for CPUs and Memory 4.2.2.5 Common Problems and Solutions for CPUs and Memory List of Expandable Sections Select each button to expand the content. Select each problem for a list of probable causes and possible solutions. The computer will not boot or it locks up. Probable causes. 
Possible solutions. The CPU has overheated. Reinstall the CPU. Replace the CPU fan. Add fans to the case. The CPU fan is failing. Replace the CPU fan. The CPU has failed. Replace the CPU. The CPU fan is making an unusual noise. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The CPU fan is failing. Replace the CPU fan. The computer reboots without warning, locks up, or displays error messages. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The front side bus is set too high. Reset to the factory default settings for the motherboard. Lower the front side bus settings. The CPU multiplier is set too high. Lower the multiplier settings. The CPU voltage is set too high. Lower the CPU voltage settings. After upgrading from a single-core CPU to a dual-core CPU, the computer runs more slowly and only shows one CPU graph in the task manager. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The BIOS does not recognize the dual-core CPU. Update the BIOS firmware to support the dual-core CPU. A CPU will not install onto the motherboard. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The CPU is the incorrect type. Replace the CPU with a CPU that matches the motherboard socket type. The computer does not recognize the RAM that was added. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The new RAM is faulty. Replace the RAM. The incorrect type of RAM was installed. Install the correct type of RAM. The RAM that has been added is not the same type of RAM that is already installed. Install the correct type of RAM. The new RAM is loose in the memory slot. Secure the RAM in the memory slot. After upgrading Windows, the computer runs very slowly. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The computer does not have enough RAM. Install additional RAM. The video card does not have enough memory. Install a video card that has more memory. Incomplete 4.2.2.6 Common Problems and Solutions for Displays 4.2.2.6 Common Problems and Solutions for Displays List of expandable sections Select each button to expand the content Select each problem for a list of probable causes and possible solutions Display has power but no image on the screen. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Video cable is loose or damaged. Reconnect or replace video cable. The computer is not sending a video signal to the external display. Use the FN key along with the multipurpose key to toggle to the external display. The display is flickering. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Images on the screen are not refreshing fast enough. Adjust the screen refresh rate. The display inverter is damaged or malfunctioning. Disassemble the display unit and replace the inverter. The image on the display looks dim. Probable causes.
possible solutions. The LCD backlight is not properly adjusted. Check the repair manual for instructions about calibrating the LCD backlight. Adjust the LCD backlight properly. Pixels on the screen are dead or not generating color. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Power to the pixels has been cut off. Contact the manufacturer. The image on the screen appears to flash lines or patterns of different color and size artifacts. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The display is not properly connected. Disassemble the display to check the connections. The GPU is overheating. Disassemble and clean the computer, checking for dust and debris. The GPU is faulty or malfunctioning. Replace the GPU. Color patterns on a screen are incorrect. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The display is not properly connected. Disassemble the display to check the connections. The GPU is overheating. Disassemble and clean the computer, checking for dust and debris. The GPU is faulty or malfunctioning. Replace the GPU. Images on a display screen are distorted. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Display settings have been changed. Restore display settings to the original factory settings. The display is not properly connected. Disassemble the computer to a point where you can check display connections. The GPU is overheating. Disassemble and clean the computer, checking for dust and debris. The GPU is faulty or malfunctioning. Replace the GPU. The display has a ghost image. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The display is experiencing burning. Power off the display and unplug it from the power source for a few hours. Use the degauss feature if it is available. Replace the display. The images on the display have distorted geometry. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The driver has become corrupted. Update or reinstall the driver in safe mode. The display settings are incorrect. Use the display settings to correct the geometry. The monitor has oversized images and icons. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The driver has become corrupted. Update or reinstall the driver in safe mode. The display settings are incorrect. Use the display settings to correct the geometry. The projector overheats and shuts down. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The fan has failed. Replace the fan. The vents are clogged. Clean the vents. The projector is in an enclosure. Remove the enclosure or ensure proper ventilation. In a multiple monitor setup, the displays are not aligned or are incorrectly oriented. The display is in VGA mode. Incomplete 4.2.3 Probable causes Possible solutions The settings for multiple monitors are not correct. 
Use the display control panel to identify each display and set the alignment and orientation. The driver has become corrupted. Update or reinstall the driver in safe mode. The display is in VGA mode. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The computer is in safe mode. Reboot the computer. The driver has become corrupted. Update or reinstall the driver in safe mode. Incomplete 4.2.3 Apply troubleshooting process to computer components and peripherals. Incomplete 4.2.3.1 Personal Reference Tools. 4.2.3.1 Personal Reference Tools. Good customer service includes providing the customer with a detailed description of the problem and the solution. It is important that a technician document all services and repairs and that this documentation is available to all other technicians. The documentation can then be used as reference material for similar problems. Personal Reference Tools Personal reference tools include troubleshooting guides, manufacturer manuals, quick reference guides, and repair journals. In addition to an invoice, a technician keeps a journal of upgrades and repairs. Notes. Make notes as you go through the troubleshooting and repair process. Refer to these notes to avoid repeating steps and to determine what needs to be done next. Journal. Include descriptions of the problem, possible solutions that have been tried to correct the problem, and the steps taken to repair the problem. Note any configuration changes made to the equipment and any replacement parts used in the repair. Your journal, along with your notes, can be valuable when you encounter similar situations in the future. History of repairs. Make a detailed list of problems and repairs, including the date, replacement parts, and customer information. The history allows a technician to determine what work has been performed on a specific computer in the past. Incomplete 4.2.3.2 Internet Reference Tools 4.2.3.2 Internet Reference Tools The Internet is an excellent source of information about specific hardware problems and possible solutions. Internet Search Engines News Groups Manufacturer FAQs Online computer manuals. Online forums and chat. Technical websites. Internet reference tools. Internet reference tools. Incomplete 4.2.3.3 Check your understanding reference tools. 4.2.3.3 Check your understanding reference tools. This question component requires you to select the matching option. When you have selected your answer, select the Submit button. Match the reference tool to the description. Notes Journal Online forums and chat sites History of repairs Includes descriptions of the problem and possible solutions that have been tried to correct the problem and the steps taken to repair the problem. A place to view questions and answers to specific computer-related technical issues they have encountered. This allows a technician to determine what work has been performed on a specific computer in the past. Refer to these to avoid repeating steps and to determine what needs to be done next. Submit. Incomplete 4.2.3.4 Advanced Problems and Solutions for Hardware. 4.2.3.4 Advanced Problems and Solutions for Hardware. List of expandable sections. Select each button to expand the content.
Select each problem for a list of probable causes and possible solutions. Raid cannot be found. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The external RAID controller is not receiving power. Check the power connection to the RAID controller. The BIOS settings are incorrect. Reconfigure the BIOS settings for the RAID controller. The RAID controller has failed. Replace the RAID controller. RAID stops working. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The external RAID controller is not receiving power. Check the power connection to the RAID controller. The RAID controller has failed. Replace the RAID controller. The computer exhibits slow performance. The computer does not recognize a removable ex Probable causes. Possible solutions. The computer does not have enough RAM. Install additional RAM. The computer is overheating. Clean the fans or install additional fans. The computer does not recognize a removable external drive. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The OS does not have the correct drivers for the removable external drive. Download the correct drivers for the drive. The USB port has too many attached devices to supply adequate power. Attach external power to the device or remove some of the USB devices. After updating the BIOS firmware, the computer will not start. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The BIOS firmware update did not install correctly. Restore the original firmware from the onboard backup if one is available. If the motherboard has two BIOS chips, the second BIOS chip can be used. Contact the motherboard manufacturer to obtain a new BIOS chip. The computer reboots without warning, locks up, or displays error messages or the BSOD. Probable causes. Possible solutions. RAM is failing. Test each RAM module to determine if they are operating correctly. The front side bus is set too high. Reset to the factory default settings of the motherboard. Lower the FSB settings. The CPU multiplier is set too high. Lower the multiplier settings. The CPU voltage is set too high. Lower the CPU voltage settings. After upgrading from a single core CPU to a multi core CPU, the computer runs slower and only shows one CPU graph in Task Manager. Probable causes. Possible solutions. The BIOS does not recognize the multi core CPU. Update the BIOS firmware to support the multi core CPU. Cannot read from source disk error is displayed when a user tries to open or save a file. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Failing drive. Replace disk. RAID not found error message is displayed. Probable causes. Possible solutions. Missing drivers for RAID controller. Check the drivers are installed and use the RAID configuration utility to verify status. Incomplete 4.2.3.5 lab, use a multimeter and a power supply tester. 4.2.3.5 lab, use a multimeter and a power supply tester.
In this lab, you will learn how to use and handle a multimeter and a power supply tester. Use a multimeter and a power supply tester. Lab use a multimeter and a power supply tester. Introduction In this lab, you will learn how to use and handle a multimeter and a power supply tester. Recommended equipment A digital multimeter The multimeter manual A battery to test A power supply tester A manual for the tester a power supply Note, the multimeter is a sensitive piece of electronic test equipment. Do not drop it or handle it carelessly. Be careful not to accidentally nick or cut the red or black wires or leads, called probes. Because it is possible to check high voltages, take extra care to avoid electrical shock. Instructions Part 1, Multimeter Step 1, Set up the multimeter Insert the red and black leads into the jacks on the meter. The black probe should go in the COM jack and the red probe should go in the PLUS, PLUS, jack. Turn on the multimeter, consult the manual if there is no on OFF switch. Questions What is the model of the multimeter? Type your answers here. What action must be taken to turn the meter on? Type your answers here. Step 2. Explore the different multimeter measurements. Switch or turn to different measurements. For example, the multimeter can be adjusted to measure ohms. Questions. How many different switch positions does the multimeter have? Type your answers here. What are they? Type your answers here. Switch or turn the multimeter to the DC voltage measurement. Question. What symbol is shown for this? Type your answers here. Step 3. Measure the voltage of a battery. Place the battery on the table. Touch the tip of the red, positive, probe to the positive, plus symbol, side of a battery. Touch the tip of the black, negative, probe to the other end of the battery. Question. What is shown on the display? Type your answers here. If the multimeter does not display a number close to the battery voltage, check the multimeter setting to ensure it is set to measure voltage, or replace the battery with a known good battery. If the number is negative, reverse the probes. Questions Name one thing you should not do when using a multimeter. Type
Check your answers here. Name one important function of a multimeter. Type your answers here. Disconnect the multimeter from the battery. Switch the multimeter to OFF. Part 1 of the lab is complete. Have your instructor verify your work. Question. Why is a digital multimeter an important piece of equipment for a technician? Explain your answer. Type your answers here. Part 2, Power Supply Tester. Complete only the steps for the connectors supported by the power supply tester that you are using. Step 1, check the testing ports for the power supply tester. Many power supply testers have connector ports to test the following power supply connectors. 20 pin slash 24 pin motherboard connector. 4-pin Molex connector 6-pin PCIe connector P4 plus 12V connector P8 plus 12V EPS connector 4-pin Berg connector 15-pin SATA connector Question Which connectors does the power supply tester you are using have? Type your answers here. Step 2. Test the power supply motherboard connector. Complete the following steps for the connectors supported by the power supply tester that you are using. A. Set the power supply switch, if available, to the off or zero position. Plug the 20-pin or 24-pin motherboard connector into the tester. Plug the power supply into an AC outlet. Set the power supply switch, if available, to the on or one position. If the power supply is working, LEDs will illuminate and you might hear a beep. If the LED lights do not illuminate, it is possible the power supply could be damaged or the motherboard connector has failed. In this instance, you must check all connections, ensure the power supply switch, if available, is set to on or one, and try again. If the LEDs still do not illuminate, consult your instructor. Possible LED lights include plus 5V, minus 5V, plus 12V, plus 5VSB, PG, minus 12V, and plus 3.3V. Question. Which LED lights are illuminated? Type your answers here. Step 3. Test the power supply Molex connector. Plug the 4-pin Molex connector into the tester. The LED illuminates on plus 12V and plus 5V. If the power output fails, the LEDs will not illuminate. Question. Which LED lights are illuminated? Type your answers here. Step 4. Test the 6-pin PCIe connector. Plug the 6-pin PCIe connector into the tester. The LED will illuminate on plus 12V. If the power output fails, the LED will not illuminate. Question. Does the LED light illuminate? Type your answers here. Step 5. Test the 5-pin SATA connector. Plug the 5-pin SATA connector into the tester. The LED will illuminate on plus 12V, plus 5V, and plus 3.3V. If the power output fails, the LEDs will not illuminate. Question. Which LED lights are illuminated? Type your answers here. Step 6. Test the 4-pin Berg connector. Plug the 4-pin Berg connector into the tester. The LED will illuminate on plus 12V and plus 5V. If the power output fails, the LEDs will not illuminate. Question. 
which LED lights are illuminated? Type your answers here. Step 7. Test the P4 slash P8 connectors. Plug the P4 plus 12V connector into the tester. The LED will illuminate on plus 12V. If the power output fails, the LEDs will not illuminate. Plug the P8 plus 12V connector into the tester. The LED will illuminate on plus 12V. If the power output fails, the LEDs will not illuminate. Question. Which LED lights are illuminated? Type your answers here. Switch the power supply to OFF or zero, if available. Disconnect the power supply from the AC outlet. Disconnect the power supply from the power supply tester. The lab is complete. Have your instructor verify your work. Question. Why is a power supply tester an important piece of equipment for a technician? Explain your answer. Type your answers here. End of document. Four dot two dot three dot six lab troubleshoot hardware problems. In this lab, you will diagnose the cause of various hardware problems and solve them. Troubleshoot hardware problems. Lab Troubleshoot Hardware Problems Introduction In this lab, you will diagnose the cause of various hardware problems and solve them. Recommended Equipment A computer with an operating system installed. Scenario You must solve hardware problems for a customer. You might also need to troubleshoot hardware connected to the computer. Make sure you document all the problems and the solutions. There are several possible errors. Follow through the lab, solving one problem at a time until you can successfully start the computers and all devices are fully functional.
you may need to ask the instructor for hardware when needed. Instructions Step 1. Start and log into the computer. Start the computer. Question. Did the computer boot successfully? Type your answers here. If the computer started, log on with an account with administrative privileges. Test all internal and external hardware devices. Question. Did all devices operate properly? Type your answers here. If the computer successfully started and all devices are fully functional, you have successfully solved all hardware problems. Hand the lab to your instructor. Step 2. Troubleshoot the hardware problem. If you could not successfully start the computer and all devices are not fully functional, continue troubleshooting the problem. Answer the following questions after each problem is solved. Questions. What problem did you find? Type your answers here. What steps did you take to determine the problem? Type your answers here. 2015 to 2019 Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco public page 1 of 2 www.nitacad.com Lab troubleshoot hardware problems. What is causing the problem? Type your answers here. List the steps taken to fix the problem. Type your answers here. End of document. 2015 to 2019 Cisco and or its affiliates. All rights reserved. Cisco public page 2 of 2 www.nitacad.com
4.3 Summary Scroll to begin. Incomplete 4.3.1 Conclusion Incomplete 4.3.1.1 Chapter 4 Preventive Maintenance and Troubleshooting 4.3.1.1 Chapter 4 Preventive Maintenance and Troubleshooting in this chapter, you learn there are many benefits of preventive maintenance, such as fewer potential hardware and software problems, less computer downtime, lower repair costs, and less frequent equipment failures. You learned how to keep dust from damaging computer components by keeping building air filters clean, cleaning the outside of the computer case, and removing dust from the inside of the computer with compressed air. Next, you learn that there are components that should be regularly inspected for dust and damage. These components include the CPU heat sink and fan, RAM modules, storage devices, adapter cards, cables and power devices, and keyboards and mice. Guidelines for ensuring optimal computer operating performance, such as not obstructing vents or airflow and maintaining proper room temperature and humidity. In addition to learning how to maintain the hardware of a computer, you also learned that it is important to perform regular maintenance on computer software. This is best accomplished with a software maintenance schedule that covers security software, virus definition files, unwanted and unused programs, and hard drive defragmenting. At the end of the chapter, you learned the six steps in the troubleshooting process as they pertain to preventative maintenance. Incomplete 4.3.1.2 Preventive Maintenance and Troubleshooting Quiz 4.3.1.2 Preventive Maintenance and Troubleshooting Quiz Incomplete Question 1 Multiple Choice Question which cleaning tool should be used to remove dust from components inside a computer case? Case? Incomplete question 2. Multiple choice question. After a problem is identified, what is the next step for the troubleshooter? Incomplete question 3. Which procedure is recommended when cleaning inside a computer? Incomplete question 4. Multiple choice question. Which task should be performed on a hard drive as part of a preventive maintenance plan? Incomplete question 5. Five. Multiple choice question. A scientific expedition team is using laptops for their work. The temperatures where the scientists are working range from minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 25 degrees Celsius, to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius. The humidity level is around 40%. 
Noise levels are low, but the terrain is rough and winds can reach 45 miles per hour, 72 kilometers per hour. When needed, the scientists stop walking and enter the data using the laptop. Which condition is most likely to adversely affect a laptop that is used in this environment? Incomplete question 6. Multiple choice question. What is a symptom of a failing power supply? Incomplete question 7. Multiple choice question. An employee mentions that opening a large document file is taking longer than usual. The desktop support technician suspects that there might be a fault in the hard disk. What should the technician do next? Incomplete question 8. Multiple choice question. Which task should be part of a hardware maintenance routine? Incomplete question 9. 